Hello, everyone, and a warm welcome to everyone here in the room and also to everyone again connected to the day two of the Airbus Summit 2022 Gathering Pace Towards Sustainable Aerospace. Yesterday, we already had more than 10,000 people connected to our live stream from all over the world. And if you're again tuning in for the second day, hello again. I'm Alex Leper, and together with my colleague Jen Newlands, we are delighted to be again your host for the second day. Today, we are broadcasting directly from the Air Airbus E-Aircraft System House at our site in Ottobrunn, near to Munich. And with more than 2,500 square meter, it is the largest test house exclusively dedicated to alternative propulsion systems and fuels in Europe. And with that, Airbus can now test zero and low emission propulsions on its own premises. The second day has again great topics for you in stock, and we are now ready to kick it off. Jen, the floor is yours. seven years have been the world's hottest, according to new climate data. Humanity has a choice, cooperate or perish. It is either a climate solidarity pact or a collective suicide pact. Many of the world's biggest companies have pledged to reach what's called net zero emissions in the coming decades. Are they on track to fulfill those promises? It is now has another colossal challenge ahead, addressing its role in climate change and the huge carbon footprint of air travel. And I'm really pleased that as an industry, you know, we are committed to achieving net zero in 2050. That's um, something we have really embarked on to lead the decarbonization of the aviation sector, but we need to do it with, uh, with other players it's a global challenge, that's for sure. Good morning, everyone. We are at a critical moment when it comes to making progress against our climate objectives. Just a few short months ago, the ICAO 41st Assembly saw member states and the aviation industry come together united behind the long-term aspirational goal to achieve net zero carbon emissions by 2050. We now have an unprecedented opportunity to turn ambition into action. But that long-awaited synergy throws into sharp relief the magnitude of the task ahead of us. At COP27 just weeks ago, we were reminded that we need to accelerate the transition from the 1.5 transition from pledges to implementation. Otherwise, there is a real risk that the 1.5 degree objective could be derailed within the next decade. Since last year's summit, Airbus and others have taken steps to move the needle in the right direction. But does everything that the sector is doing, such as SAF partnerships, technology investment, fleet replacement, enough to achieve this trajectory, especially given traffic growth forecasts? We are reminded that commitments and targets alone are not enough, and collaboration will be critical to achieving tangible, lasting action. So here we are to explore the concrete collaborative steps that we can take together to enable net zero aviation. So I am delighted to introduce our panel this morning from Airbus, our Chief Technical Officer, Savina Klauke. Good morning, Savina. We're very happy to have the President of the Environmental Defense Fund, Fred Krupp. Good morning. Good morning, nice to have you with us. And joining us from the UK, we have the Director of Aviation at the UK Government Department of Transport, Ben Smith. Good morning, Ben. Good morning. Can you hear us? I can, I hope you can hear me okay there. Loud and clear, thank you very much. And we're going to start with you, Ben. Um, what comes now that the long-term aspirational goal for the aviation sector to reduce carbon emissions to net zero by 2050 has been adopted by the ICAO member states? 
Uh, well, thanks very much, uh, Jennifer, for the question, and good morning from London. Uh, as you said, uh, I'm the Aviation Director here at the UK Department for Transport. First of all, I'd just like to uh, send apologies on behalf of Dr. Rania leon our Director General for Civil Aviation, who uh, unfortunately wasn't able to be here um, today. The, the, the long-term aspirational goal for reducing aviation carbon emissions is something the UK has worked tirelessly towards over many years, uh, and it's an agreement, uh, it's an agreement that we're very, very uh, pleased to see and it represents a very significant milestone for the aviation sector. It complements industry's own net zero 2050 goal by showing that governments worldwide are committed to reaching the same goal and doing so together. It provides a foundation for strengthening ICAO's existing technology standards and the Corsia offsetting scheme and I hope that it will draw investment into aviation decarbonisation schemes and improve accountability by allowing our progress to be measured against a single common goal. And can you share some insight into what's happening in the UK to move the needle from a member state perspective? Absolutely. If I may, just first of all, I just wanted to talk about a few things that I think are happening globally as well. Um, certainly, ICAO's own report on the long-term goal shows that around 50 to 60 percent of the necessary emissions reductions will need to come from alternative fuels. Uh, and ICAO is already planning a third conference on aviation alternative fuels in November next year to discuss next steps in this area. And to me, it's clear that the conference has to send a strong demand signal by committing to a long-term SAF objective based on the net zero 2050 goal. At the same time, we know there are regions of the world that will need assistance to move towards net zero. And in the UK, we have recently started offering support for Corsia implementation to six states in East Africa, working jointly with our partners in Kenya. And the UK also intends to participate in ICAO's ACT SAF capacity building programme. Many of you will recall that at COP26 in Glasgow, we launched the International Aviation Climate Ambition Coalition. The coalition has now grown to 59 member governments and has achieved its primary objective of securing a Paris consistent long term goal through ICAO. And we're now considering how the coalition can continue to add value in support to ICAO over the next few years. But turning to what we're doing in the UK, our Jet Zero strategy that we published earlier this year has committed to achieving net zero aviation emissions by 2050 in line with the UK's legally binding targets. Altogether, there are 62 commitments in the strategy, uh, including a target for UK domestic flights to reach net zero by 2040, a target for English airport operations to be zero emission by 2040, a commitment to having at least five UK SAF plants under construction by 2025, and a SAF mandate in place with a target of at least 10% SAF in the UK jet fuel mix by 2030. And the strategy has three guiding principles. Firstly, international leadership, uh, and then delivered in partnership and maximising opportunities. And it sets out policies across six key measures in total, focusing on system efficiencies across our airports, airspace and aircraft, building a thriving UK SAF industry, developing and bringing into commercial service novel forms of aircraft that offer the potential for zero carbon tailpipe emissions, creating successful carbon markets and investing in greenhouse gas removals, influencing consumers to make sustainable travel choices and addressing non-CO2 impacts. And the strategy is seen overseen by our Jet Zero Council, uh, which I'm delighted to say Airbus is a member of. It brings together CEO-level stakeholders across government, industry and academia and is chaired here by our transport and business secretaries. So I hope that gives you a clear overview of where we are and where we intend to go next. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll come back to some of those points a bit later on. But turning now to you, um, Fred, and thank you for joining us. Um, I think some people in the room might not be familiar with the Environmental Defence Fund. Could you tell us about that, what it stands for and how it operates? Sure. The Environmental Defence Fund is a non-profit uh, bringing together a couple of million activists and supporters around the world. And um, we're all in on climate. Our mission is to stabilize the atmosphere, to strengthen the ability of nature and people to thrive given the climate change that we're already experiencing, and to support human health. We're all about doing that in a way that puts people at the center and supports people's livelihoods, allow, allowing people uh, to thrive while we're solving these problems. We're um, a thousand employees with four anchor regions of China, India, Europe, and the United States. 
um, although we work in about 30 countries around the world. And recently, I think, um, we've become known for our work on methane over the last decade to put methane front and center. Um, and we are, uh, we've constructed an $88 million satellite, which will launch next year to um, trust but verify all the commitments that have been made around the world. We'll be able to look at the world's oil and gas infrastructure, every major piece of oil and gas infrastructure, multiple times per week. And we'll make that information available for free to everyone so that um, companies can be and countries can be held accountable to the commitments that they've made recently. Fantastic. And when you listen to the aviation industry, we'd really, um, we're wondering if you believe we have the right priorities to translate the commitments we're making into viable progress. Are we going fast enough? Are we focusing on the right things? What's your <coughs> perspective when you look at the aviation industry? Well, one thing I'd say is uh, the direction is, uh, is right. The speed is nowhere near fast enough. So directionally, putting a price on climate pollution uh, gets the incentive right, so that's a good thing to do. Putting mandates in place, complementary measures to produce sustainable aviation fuel, SAF, uh, that's a good thing to do. But the challenge is in the details. Um, SAF, for instance, we have to make sure that we're not producing that at the expense of food, uh, forests, or biodiversity, and that's a big, big challenge. Uh, hydrogen, uh, there was a lot of talk yesterday about Airbus's interest in hydrogen. Well, hydrogen can be a good thing, but not necessarily unless we have an excess of electrons, unless we have already taken coal out of the grid. If, if we're using renewable energy instead to produce hydrogen, uh, that could be taking us backwards. And so we need to be very, very careful. Plus, there's the issue of hydrogen leaking Recently, we've learned that hydrogen leaking is um, like methane. Um, and right now, neither Airbus nor any other comp company even has the equipment to measure hydrogen leakage. The, be, I know that because the equipment is not manufactured. You can, you can measure big leaks that cause a risk for explosion, but not the small leaks that accumulate to uh, make global warming worse. Um, and um, so how hydrogen is produced, how it's transported, how it's used, whether we have an excess of, of green electrons is a real, a real important issue. So are we going fast enough? As I said, uh, no, and just the details matter tremendously. So you feel that we're not addressing the details or have you not been hearing that from the industry over the past few months? Um, I. That's a challenge to us. <laughs> I would say uh, there hasn't been um, uh, a consensus yet reached by policymakers as well as people in the industry, um, as well as scientists about what the um, standards need to be in order to make sure SAF and hydrogen are steps forward and not um, steps backward. Okay, very interesting. I'm sure we'll address those topics. Sabine, over to you. During the course of the summit, we've talked about some of the levers, and um, Fred just mentioned them, you know, sustainable aviation fu fuels, some of the disruptive technologies. There's also the air traffic management solutions that we saw on the flight last night, um, and of course, fleet renewal. Um, what, what else are we doing? What can you, what can you bring that would complement all of that, Sabina? Yeah, thank you for that question. Let me just think back for a little moment. Last year, September, when I was first introducing even myself to you guys and then being in the subject, it was a lot about intentions, commitments, ways we wanted to take. Yesterday, and it will go on today, we were a lot on, OK, what is really happening? How is this getting reality? And this is, of course, very close to my heart because there is so much going on. And I feel a bit bad about what we did with you yesterday. I think we pumped everything <laughs> into you, and hopefully you have the time to digest. And here, 
especially today, I'm really proud of having you here because we are kind of in the heart of the testing center of what is the e-power that we need on, on the aircraft. This is our e-system powerhouse where we do all the tests, and we will see that later on today. For now, let's exactly do that step back. What else is needed? And here, I think we've heard already a lot of aspects, and um, we'll probably go into detail in, the, uh, in the, one of the other topic. But for, for me, it's really coming back to three things. We need a global playing field. I think it's, yeah, it's good how we take it in the one region or the other. In the end, aviation is a very worldwide topic, our climate and the atmosphere as well. We cannot play that in a regional level, so we need a global playing field. And so in this regard, we are really very happy in what happened in the last ACAO conference that, that we got a step into the right direction. Um, but that's, of course, just the starting point. The second one, and you mentioned part of it, we need acceleration. The governmental framework and the frameworks that we have, we need to far be quicker in that. If you just think about SAF, it's all about implementation, deployment now. So here we need the right levers in terms of, yeah, and taxation is one, targets, but as well incentives. And we need to go far quicker in these um, investments and decisions for investments as well. And the third one, and that's one which is again really close to my heart, is collaboration. The, the topic is, has a size that it's clear. If we just do the best aircraft and technology that we think of, it will not be enough. It is not enough. We cannot do it alone. So we, we need to work in partnerships on that, being with the scientists, being it with all the different sectoral synergies that we can have, and we had uh, some of, of the levers yesterday, but also <coughs> in all kinds of yeah, outreaching uh, partnerships and, and the coalitions are some, the alliances that are, that are coming into place and we are trying to play our role as a leader, as a catalyst into that and we take that very seriously because of course at the heart is the product for us but it's then <laughs> reaching out far broader and, and this is what we, what, we, what we need help with but where we are also really looking cross-sectorial. And, and if you just think about what we just said about the atmosphere, let's be sure that we are doing the right things. We need far more understanding of the impacts, uh, yeah, of the details to the atmosphere. We are active with MIT, we are active with DLR to, to set the models up, because there's just not enough understanding out there. Uh, and shall we more look into the long-term levers or the short-term levers, what is more impact. These are the things that we have to build, and we have to build them together. So we are really committed into that, but that's really, for me, the three things that we need. Global level playing field, acceleration, um, and then collaboration in a wider space in order to make it happen. And how do you respond to Fred's comment about the fact that there might not be enough green electrons out there for the hydrogen projects we have. Yeah, so I think um, there were two things which, which are, of course, Im important in the overall field. The one was about hydrogen. Do we have enough energy and how do we use the energy to, uh, to go into that? And you also talked about the point about leakage and is it yeah, what, what about the impact? So our view to that is really that if we look into the overall system um, and the overall, uh, let's say, positives and, ma and maybe um, uh, backdraws of hydrogen, we are convinced that it's just far more on the positives in the overall balance of, uh, of things that then um, if we go on like, like what we have. So then, of course, we need to be sure that we have enough green energy, and, and that's, that's a topic generally. All, all, the, all the, let's say, alternative propulsion means that we can think of, and even if we think about SAF, it will be about uh, power to liquid, and then it's again about energy and, and hydrogen. Um, 
will need more energy. So that's core and center in the, in the general question. And secondly, to the leakage, of course, there is as well technical answers to that. But again, we need to create understanding. And, and we are actually active with, uh, with different um, research institutes on that. There is also, if we look to the technical side, we can use catalysts. It's maybe difficult to, to measure, first of all. But if we put catalyst to, to make sure that the hydrogen, which is about to leak, is actually becoming water before it leaks, then, then you can come around the topic, of, of course. So understanding first, important. Technical levers can be there, and, 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 and we want to take them. And we need to look at the, at, the, at the global balance. And here we are far on the positive side, and we are, uh, we are really convinced about that. Yeah, if I could, the um, hydrogen is, is a really important topic because it it's not only goes to what could be burned in an aircraft or used uh, with a fuel cell to generate electricity in an aircraft. It also goes to the question of sustainable aviation fuels. Because in the long run, instead of making them out of biological material, the idea of power to liquids or e-fuels um, <coughs> is promising if we can get you know, the cost down. But those e-fuels are made out of hydrogen. So the, the first point is um, we don't want to rob Peter to pay Paul. If we still have you know, all these coal-fired power plants in South Africa, um, and South Africa decides, oh, we can make money s supplying the world uh, green hydrogen, and they build solar um, fields, to, but they haven't replaced their coal. That's a, it would be a lot better for them to replace their coal first and not get sucked into making hydrogen for aviation fuel. And, and that's true around the world, not just in s South Africa. It's just a v vivid example that's a real one. Um, but the second is this leakage issue, and, and because this is new to most people, there's three ways that hydrogen reacts in the atmosphere to accelerate global warming. Hydrogen itself is not a greenhouse gas. It's indirectly a greenhouse gas, and that's why these effects were largely ignored until recently. Everyone knew or over the last 10 years we've all been learning that methane is directly a greenhouse gas, but hydrogen, when it leaks into the atmosphere, forms water vapor. Uh, that warms the planet. It, it uh, forms uh, smog when that drifts to the upper atmosphere. That warms the planet. And then most serious, about half the effect uh, comes from it reacting with the hydroxyl radical OH. And OH is important because that's breaking down the methane. And so when you take the hydroxyl radical out of the atmosphere, you're extending the shelf life, the half life of, of methane. So this hydrogen leakage that no one is yet measuring for because there's not the instrumentation, but thankfully Aerodyne Research is developing an instrument that should be available soon um, to measure it at these small quantities. There are, me there are meters to measure it in much bigger quantities. Um, you know, we just need to pay a lot of attention to this. And what's new, newly published research suggests that the effect of hydrogen leakage is double or maybe um, as much as six times the warming effect as was previously known. So that, that's why we need to pay attention to this. So, so Sabine, how, are, how is the aviation industry addressing these non-CO2 um, emissions? Yeah, let me maybe go on, on the, the second big topic you raised was about the SAFs and then how we call it in German, the competition between uh, teller and tank. So the plates, so the food and, 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 and the combustion side of, of things and the fuels. So um, if you look globally, then theoretically there is enough biomass to do a lot of things and to basically come to the needs uh, of volume that we have. But you're completely right. If there is no standard, then the competition will happen. And, and there is, for actual facts, that, that will happen in areas um, if, if the standards are not there. So in our view, first of all, we need the right standards to, to be sure that, that there is the right bio stuff. And second, we really think we need to do both, uh, because then you need the SAF based on biomass, 
And we need to think as well power to liquid, so synthetic fuels, and then we are going onto, onto different feedstocks. So uh, then we are coming back to energy and, 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 and hydrogen. So we really need to do both. And again, we need as well the regulatory framework to, to make sure that the things happen in the right manner. Yeah, I'm not sure, Sabine, <coughs> that there is enough biomass. We're, we're now creating 100,000 um, tons of SAF a year. Aviation uses, what, 250 million tons a year. Um, but you know, I appreciate Airbus's leadership on these issues, and I, I've talked to Glenn, and I know you're taking these issues seriously. I, 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 and I look forward to exchanging information as to whether there is enough biomass. There are some, you know, uh, people are calling biomass made out of uh, beef tallow um, sustainable, but if you make it more profitable to ranch cattle in Brazil and rip down more rainforest, calling that SAF makes no sense. So um, I, 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 we, we look forward to digging in with your technical team on um, this issue of whether even if you look the, the world over, there is enough biomass. Um, I, I am skeptical. And I, and I agree with you. That's a theoretical uh, view of the things. And this is why we are completely into the point, and I think we agree here. Um, uh, we need to do both. Yeah? So there is um, the biofuel that we can do, and, and with the right feedstocks, but we need to make sure that the right feedstocks are going into it. And then we need to go towards PTL. Let me come back to the point of, and you, you basically said, yes, there is other things. There is the vapor, the water vapor with hydrogen in the air. That's basically what we call contrails. Um, uh, and, and this has an effect as well. So here again, we are very active in understanding the impact and really doing the right scientific world together with the scientists which are out there. So I'm, I'm just taking... Uh, two examples. So we have we have done the the Eclipse flights, which is more on the other non-CO2 effects, where we actually flew 100% ZAF, and and of course we we went as well behind the aircraft to to measure to see exactly what what is the impact actually by uh, by flying with different kerosenes. And secondly, we have the project which we call Blue Condor, where we are flying hydrogen on a little glider aircraft with a little additional motor, with the, with the sole um, objective actually to measure the impacts in the atmosphere. And, and of course, uh, it's about the contrails. Um, and, and this has started, the flights have started uh, this December. And first of all, uh, flying the aircraft and, and checking everything. And then next, in the, in the Q1, we will have the real tests on, on the contrail side. And then, of course, we can have um, measures around that, and we were talking about what are operational measures that we can have which help um, uh, emissions and which, which help to, uh, uh, to actually improve. So here it's as well, of course, about the ATM measures. So if we know there is an area where contrails will be uh, more present, and you know that's, that's depending on the climate uh, situation in, in a certain height, then you can go on a different flight path. You can go uh, a bit lower, and, and you avoid the thing. So these are things that we also have to look at, and which are, of course, then impacting and, and, and breaking or uh, putting that part into, into the topic as well. Thank so you. again, here it's a lot about the understanding of the impact and then about acting technically and, and in the, let's say as well, governmental framework in order to have the right standards and, and making sure that, uh, that we are doing it uh, consciously. Thank you. I'm going to change subjects a bit here and I'm going to turn to Ben Smith. Um, maybe touch on offsetting. Um, ben, can you talk a bit about Corsia, the Carbon Offsetting and Reduction Scheme for International Aviation. Do you think it goes far enough? Do you think we're acting quickly enough on offsetting? Thanks. Uh, well, look, I mean, I think um, 
we believe Corsia is the single most important means of contributing towards ICAO's medium-term goal of carbon neutral growth from 2020. And we were really pleased to see its environmental integrity maintained uh, in the agreement at the ICAO Assembly. So we, we fully support uh, the Corsia scheme. Now that the net zero 2050 goal has been agreed at ICAO, uh, it's really clear that Corsia has an important role to play in complementing and incentivising the in-sector measures that will make the most significant contribution <coughs> to decarbonisation. Uh, effective implementation is definitely the next step forward, uh, but as experience is built, the UK will be seeking for Corsia to be improved and strengthened and ultimately brought into alignment with net zero by 2050. In the long term, we recognise that Corsia or a successor scheme must shift to predominantly focus on carbon removals as the means of offsetting as opposed to avoided emissions. So I think it's really important. We're really pleased to see it strengthened. Um, clearly, um, in the future, it, it, needs to be, it needs to be strengthened further and move to focusing on, on, on those removals. Yeah, Maybe I you. can can add on this one. Y you were evoking the carbon removals, and I think that's that's one one of the topics, and which is as well for me an example of partnership, which is going beyond yeah the p sheer technical preparation of things, but where we where we really see again a, a very big potential, and we've actually just announced a partnership with one of the. Uh, carbon capture, direct air, carbon capture um, companies, uh, carbon engineering, um, where we have actually engaged in taking yeah, uh, 100,000 tons a year over the next uh, four years in order to just help them uh, getting along. But it's also an example. So I think it's a very big potential, and we need these kind of technologies. But it's also an example of there is no regulation. There is a regulation in a very uh, concise area, in this case California, but we don't have a global regulation on that, how that can be taken into account and how that can help yeah, bringing the things uh, forward. So Fred, do you share Sabine's optimism about DAX, about carbon capture? Um, in general, I am very optimistic, but I think uh, carbon capture right now is extremely expensive, and there's so many things that we can do right now with existing technologies. But I, I do want to say that um, we, um, th that I appreciate Airbus's leadership in bringing about um, uh, Corsi in the first place, and I appreciate Europe's leadership on aviation. Uh, without Europe and years ago, Connie Hedegaard, I am not sure we would uh, have be as far along as we are, even though we have a long way to go. And um, it's such an important problem because according to Airbus's own figures, aviation is growing, uh, emissions from aviation growing 3.6% a year, which means doubling in 20 years. Doubling in 20 years, but um, the IEA says that we need to uh, peak it um, at, at uh, 2025, um, and so that's inconsistent. So this is a big challenge, and at the same time, it's an inspiring opportunity to bring the world together. And I think, you know, we have to find a way here in Europe to um, harmonize between the ETS system and ICAO, but harmonize upward. Uh, to higher integrity, uh, uh, strength their goals. I think the, the progress recently at the ICAO assembly of you know, 2050 net zero is good, but what's next? What's the short-term goal? What's the 2025 goal? Um, the, you know, so we need um, you know, more leadership from um, all of the above, from, from Europe, from Airbus, from the industry to get where we need to go in order to um, keep aviation's license to operate with the public. So, and yeah, you evoke the, the grows, and let me maybe just do the, the backwards view of that. So if we look back into the maybe 90s, 30, 30 years back, towards today, with just the continuous improvement of, of the, the product, of the aircraft, we have improved by 53% on the emissions, on the efficiency and on the emissions. 
So of course, that's just a start, but that's what we have. If we look now into the worldwide fleet, then of course there's, there's about 20% of these new standard aircraft which are flying. Uh, so that's something where we have an immediate effect with every, every single aircraft which is, which is basically changed from an old one to a new one. So that's an immediate uh, effect and an immediate thing uh, which, is, which is coming into play. Then I, I'm, I'm fully with you. There is more that we need to do around that. So fleet renewal is one thing, SAF is another, operational means. But then, so how do we play with the governments? And I, I wanted to relate back to Ben uh, as well. Uh, so let me just take one example where we are active. Uh, you said the Jet Zero Council. So that's one of the positive examples I really think where yeah, we've created something um, with the UK government, uh, a, a kind of yeah, really cross-sectoral um, partnership where things and people come together between the government, the industry, and, and, and we are actively engaged here together. So we need, we need far more of that in order to accelerate and to make sure that, that this is yeah, not only shining from a certain country or Europe or a region out into the world, but really to make it a, a global playing field. Thank you. Um, so just to put things in perspective, oh, sorry, Ben, did you want to respond? Um, just, just, just briefly, uh, I, thank you, uh, Sabine. I mean, I hopefully, uh, we are uh, really encouraged by the progress that we've been able to make through the Jet Zero Council. And as you say, it's that bringing together of the industry uh, with government leadership, uh, you know, all, all sectors of the industry, airlines, airports, uh, manufacturers, um, and, and ensuring that there's a, there's a discussion here about how collectively uh, we can move forward. Because as I said right at the start, um, there is now agreement uh, between governments at the global level Level through ICAO uh, and uh, with the with the industry uh, target um, through IATA to to ensure that we do move towards um, net zero emissions uh, by by 2050. Um, and just to also just briefly add, I mean, uh, you know, I think there's a real sense coming through this discussion that, um, as Fred said, uh, we need to uh, act quickly. Um, but also, as Sabine was saying, that we need to um, be taking all the opportunities that are that are out there. Um, it's not a case of choosing between um, alternative fuels. Um, or, or, or hydrogen. Uh, it's definitely a case of exploring uh, what we can achieve uh, with both, what we can do in the short term to start bringing about those emissions reductions as quickly as we can, but also looking ahead to the longer term and, uh, and looking for ways to really uh, maximise the opportunities that are out there, um, working with um, academia uh, and with the science community to ensure that um, where there are opportunities, they are, they are fully explored and we're really getting the full, the full benefits from them in the future. Exactly. Yeah, I believe that's kind of the, the main themes that we're listening to over the past couple of days, the, nece the necessity for collaboration and the idea that all of these different technologies need to work in parallel and converge at some point to, to meet our goals. Um, I think it's time to open up to the room for some questions. Um, we also have our online viewers who can ask questions using the Q&A function on the YouTube page. So um, let's see if we've got some questions in the room. Please state your name and the publication you work for when you get the microphone in your hand and it is on its way down here on the front. Lois, please, thank you. Good morning, Michel Suman, Ernest I just had a quick look on uh, hydrogen leakage to get a better understanding and I see there have been some recent reports that one of that. Um, can you further describe what is the risk of hydrogen leakage within the uh, aviation ecosystem? Um, what, what, what are the, the main concerns here? And to Sabina Clarke, how is Airbus uh, looking at this? Uh, we discussed yesterday on the flight how you are involved in the, the, the test with hydrogen in Hamburg. Um, is this something, hydrogen leakage, that Airbus is looking very carefully into? And what is the potential risk and how will this affect your hydrogen project? So maybe you first. Well, I would <laughs> just say that, unfortunately, I cannot describe in detail because to describe in detail requires empirical measurements. When we first started working on methane leakage, every oil company in the world told us 
And I think they believed it, that their systems were designed not to leak, and they didn't leak. And then they were so confident of this, they gave us permission to go on site and measure the leakage, and we found, unfortunately, vast leaks, much more uh, than even the government was estimating, 60% more in the United States, for example. So with hydrogen, um, we basically need to go out and begin measuring. The concern I have is, you know, if you're making hydrogen in one place and using it to make green steel right there, there's very little opportunity for leakage. If you're distributing hydrogen all over the world to many airports and many vehicles or many airplanes, a distributed system, uh, it just intuitively there's more opportunities to leak. But I cannot tell you in detail, and I look forward to working on this cooperatively with Airbus and actually going out and beginning to measure to see what the real leakage rate in the real world is. Yeah, so maybe uh, I try to add on that. I mean, hydrogen H2 is a very small molecule, and that is why it's the smallest. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's right at the left <laughs> upper corner of the <laughs> of the system, and this is why it's it's more easy or more prone to leak. Now it's it's as you say, we don't have enough knowledge about it. So what we have engaged and what we are engaging in is, uh, together with the MAT, for instance, we have we have a partnership in order to work on that. Uh, and we've also a partnership with the DLR to better understand the overall model and impacts on the atmosphere. They have uh, built a very good model on that. So these are things which we have started because we, we, we do think we need to understand more in order to be able to act. So we take it very seriously. Then overall, we are uh, still very convinced that the overall balance so even if we think about, uh, I don't know, 10% leakage, but we just don't know because we cannot measure, um, that is by far outweighing, the benefits are by far outweighing uh, the not doing it. And then I evoked it shortly before, there are as well technical means to deal with it. So first we need to understand and then we can as well prepare uh, against it. So basically, we're working with, with catalysts then, uh, which would actually prevent the, the H2, the ones which would be prone to leak. You take them before through the catalyst, you make water out of it before they leak, so that it's, it's contained. And these are just some examples of, of how we can then technically cope with the problem. Generally, we need to understand it, and then in order to go further to do it. But the overall view of, of the balance of, let's say, positives and, and the, yeah, the things that we have to deal with in detail are uh, by far outweighing to the positive in our view. Thank you. Tim. Uh, yeah, Tim Robinson, uh, Aerospace Magazine. Uh, a question to, to Ben, really, and, and talking about the, the, the uh, ambition to accelerate things. With the Jet Zero Council, we obviously have high-level goals and initiatives there. Uh, but I'm wondering whether there's a case for um, the UK to get the ball rolling on some uh, non-CO2 impact demos, uh, you know, contra reduction trials across the transatlantic. That, that looks like a, a kind of an easy, low-hanging fruit and a no-brainer where the, the UK could work with Airbus, airlines, and uh, get things moving. Thanks. Thanks. Yes. No. Uh, absolutely. Um, the the sort of looking and addressing the non CO two impacts of, of aviation emissions are uh, one of the one of the sort of key policy areas that we want to take forward as part of the as part of the Jet Zero strategy. So those are exactly the sorts of things that we will want to be uh, looking at. Um, obviously, the Jet Zero strategy is quite a quite a big package of of, of different measures. Um, and as we've uh, as we've launched this year, we're now sort of moving uh, quickly into uh, looking at how we 
we prioritise and, and take forward the measures that are that are contained in it. Uh, but but that's very much um, a part of it, uh, and we will certainly want to be looking at different ways in which we can, as you say, um, get engaged with uh, with others around the world who are looking at these issues, um, understand them more, and start to develop um, some clearer plans about how we can address those impacts uh, into into the future. Yes, and if I remember right, there is also partnerships work, scientific work ongoing with the different universities, Stanford, for instance, in, uh, and then uh, in the UK we have Cren Cranfield. So uh, there is a very active uh, community as well in this. So we welcome that. Thank you. Next question from Tim Heffer. Hi, I'm Tim Heffer from Reuters. Um, perhaps a question for Sabina. Um, oh, you're talking about the problem of leaks in terms of the overall balance and, and benefits and so forth, but perhaps to the lay person, if you're talking about leaking hydrogen, that doesn't sound like a great idea for an aircraft. What are the safety implications of that? And if I could ask our other two speakers, we've heard these arguments um, over the months again today that just taking delivery of aircraft that have been developed already is good for the environment. Um, are you convinced by this argument that, you know, essentially just delivering aircraft, that executing an industrial strategy that already exists, is that a green response by the aviation industry? And just finally, if the problem is essentially mainly about SAF, which is really an energy product, I'd love to know, especially from uh, Ben Smith, wouldn't it be better, more productive for governments and private investors to put their funding into the energy industry rather than the aerospace industry. Who wants to start? Shall I start with the yes, why don't hydrogen you try part? Again? So, of course, looking into a technology like hydrogen, the first questions we had and the first very basic um, tests and, and, and learnings we had was on the safety question, because everybody knows from school, if you mix hydrogen, this can be explosive. So, so that's something which we treated very first, and we had very positive results, so we are really encouraged to go further into that. Then, I mean, along the path, of course, you come across different things uh, and different technical things that you need to reconsider and, 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 and go on with. So one of the points which we are discussing today, and it's taking a lot of space, is this point about general liquid of hydrogen. And I think we discussed it because it's just one of the topics, and you said it, uh, that yes, the devil is in the detail. It's one of the detail points which has just come out now, and this is why we are discussing it. So it's more the general topic of yeah, how much do we lose, what does it do in the atmosphere. And so for me, the safety topic is contained. We did it as a as the very first step, and we will go on with that. And then the the other topic we are discussing now is about the leakage and how we can first understand and then go around it. If that makes sense. On fleet renewal? Yeah, um, the uh, overall the answer has to be a global system that caps emissions from the aviation system. And how do you do that? Uh, one way is through fleet renewal. More uh, efficient aircraft definitely can bring down emissions. Another way uh, to do that is, uh, you know, with carbon credits, but they have to be high integrity. The public is not going to buy a system that allows um, scam credits into the system. Uh, and that, you know, that's important no matter what the system is, uh, if you're looking for most reductions at least cost. And then the third, as you say, is high integrity SAF. And um, the Environmental Defense Fund in August published the, the handbook, the gold standard on um, high integrity SAF handbook, and you can find it. And that's, we have to keep to that because um, if SAF becomes another loophole uh, to do things that you know, take us backwards, it's, it's not going to be good for people who manufacture or 
the aviation companies that fly people around. The whole system has to have high integrity. Ben, would you like to comment on Tim's question? Sure, yeah. So, look, I mean, on, on, on uh, aircraft um, technology developments and uh, improvements in the efficiency uh, of airframes, engines, um, and everything that goes into aircraft construction and manufacture, um, I mean, as has been said earlier on, I mean, this has been an area that has delivered significant emissions reductions over, over the last few decades. And I think uh, it's important uh, that that continues, that that trajectory continues towards aircraft and newer aircraft becoming more fuel efficient uh, and producing less um, CO2 emissions uh, and other emissions when they when they fly. Uh, but clearly, that's not the only part of the story here, uh, and that's why through our through our Jet Zero strategy in the UK, you know, it goes goes much wider than that uh, into the areas that we've been discussing around sustainable fuel and future uh, aircraft technologies, uh, different propulsion um, systems, and 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 a, and a whole range of things we want to do, in, including um, making uh, airports. Uh, um, uh, zero emission uh, and, uh, and 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 working with the industry and academia to 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 really look for other options into the future. So I think it's an important part of the mix, but it's clearly not the only uh, the only answer uh, the only answer here. Um, you asked also about um, sustainable aviation fuel uh, and investment um, in it. I mean, I think that is clearly um, crucial, uh, and we are really keen uh, and and actively exploring how we can um, develop the SAF production industry um, in the UK. Uh, we think given that the UK is uh, such an important global aviation hub, um, that it's right that we should uh, be, be doing everything we can to encourage and incentivize the production of SAF um, in, in, in our country uh, itself. Um, so we're, we're committed to supporting uh, the UK SAF industry. Uh, we've got £180 million pounds worth of funding committed um, over the next three years. Uh, it's something I'm talking regularly to um, airlines uh, and, 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 and manufacturers about um, at the moment. Um, there are calls for us to look at introducing a, a form of uh, price support for sustainable aviation fuel, uh, given the scale of the challenge, um, and the decision to offer a, a price stability mechanism in addition to the SAF mandate would be a complex one, uh, and it's therefore, I think, right that we consider a range of information, including value for money, cost impacts, and potential unintended consequences. Um, but we are working very actively on that at the moment uh, and are looking to reach a preferred uh, position on how to further stimulate investment in the UK SAF industry by the end of the year. But as, all, as we've already uh, set out, uh, and as I mentioned earlier, we already have a, a commitment to uh, get at least five um, SAF plants under construction in the UK by 2025, and then that all-important SAF mandate uh, to have at least 10% of UK jet fuel mix uh, comprising SAF by 2030. Thank you, Ben. We have another question over here. Jan Koschnek, Eric Cosmos. Mr. Krupp, um I've been listening very carefully to your uh, warnings about the amount of biomass uh, uh, capacity, uh, the hydrogen uh, leakage. Uh, what is your solution? What do you propose? Because apparently you have some fears and then it is, it is worth uh, listening to it. But uh, what is your technical solution to the issue? Thank you for the question. Well, the Environmental Defense Fund is known for being constructive, so thank you for asking that question. It's not as though we are against hydrogen. Hydrogen definitely has a place in a sustainable world and, and may have a place in sustainable aviation. Um, it is that we are for diving into the details, and that's why journalists matter. Because just to go with the flow that you know, hydrogen is the solution for everything, which is right now, it's way beyond the aviation industry. Hydrogen is kind of the fad. Um, we have to get underneath that and see for which uses and how is it gonna be produced and is there an excess of electrons? So, I mean, my answer would be that uh, we need a system that uh, puts in place the incentives to um, develop the answers, whether it's more efficient aircraft is part of it, sustainable aviation fuels, which I think is more likely to be e-fuels than biologically based fuels, that the standards for those e-fuels um, and how we phase them in needs to be very careful. And overall, there's 
um, a pathway to this net zero goal, which happily has been adopted, but we have to have interim short-term goals and then let the industry figure that out as long as the, exactly what the answers are within these standards. I think it's a good thing to, for governments to be jump-starting the production of e-fuels and SAF as long as the standards are in place. I guess, uh, I think directionally we're going in the right direction. I don't mean to throw cold water on that. All I'm saying, and this is where you journalists in the room come in, is that pay attention to the details because the details matter a lot. May I add to that? So first of all, I really want to thank you and the, and the Environmental Defense Fund because we are really acknowledging how constructive you are in the discussion. And as well, I think the point on going into the details, putting the points out, helps us in the overall understanding, and that's what we need. And then I, I think we are in exactly this overall reflection. There is a lot of technical things that we have to prepare and that we get, get onto during the path and discovering new things and, and, and taking them on board. We have that whole question of how is the measurement system around that and in order to cope with it. And that's just a system that we put in place in order to go forward and to, to help that development. So a lot is getting, and I think we need exactly that mi mix, governments helping kickstarting, doing pragmatic things right away. And on the other hand, we have to build that system, which is getting more and more complete. So for me, we are focusing on CO2 today because that's the thing that we can best measure and take somehow into these complex systems like Corsia and, and others and in targets. Um, tomorrow, we will have to have more understanding on the rest and, and to put that into a more complete system. So this is, I think, it can only go in parallel. First, if we wait for a complete system, then we will not have done anything <laughs> by the time it's too late. So we need to do the concrete actions, technically, and in the creating of the understanding. And then we need to really um, go forward with, as well, coping up with the system to help us putting in the right direction. So here, it's again, at the moment, I think it has to go by targets and incentives in order to go fast. And then we have to build uh, this on the flow. Thank you. I think we have time for one last question, if it's very short, and make sure we have a short answer. Down here on the front. Thanks. Thierry Dubois, Aviation Week. A question for Fred. You mentioned that uh, hydrogen has a is an indirect contributor to the greenhouse effect. How does it compare to CO2? Is, it, is one kilogram of uh, hydrogen, does it have the same uh, climate impact as one kilogram of CO2? Yeah. Um, I don't have the number on the top of my head, but it is, it is many, many multiples more uh, of an effect than a CO2. Um, you know, I don't, 20 yeah. times comes to mind as an estimate kilogram per kilogram, but I'll need to check that and get back to you. I think the point right now, what we can do is make sure that as we subsidize hydrogen, not only in aviation, but all over the world for all sorts of uses, that when governments subsidize the production and the use of it, that there's requirements to measure the leakage. You know, that's a concrete thing to do. Right now, as we promote SAF, let's make sure that the high integrity stand standards are in place. In the United States, this, we've just passed the Inflation Reduction Act, subsidizing the production of hydrogen and the production of SAF but we haven't written the standards yet. Those standards need to be tight to make sure these steps are forward and not sideways or even backward. Thank you. I think that's a great way to conclude our panel today. Thank you, we need to wrap up. That was a very interesting and constructive 
discussion. It turned out to be a bit more technical, I think, than what we had anticipated, but um, very interesting, and, and I think we all learned quite a bit. Thank you for challenging us. Um, we take away the need to focus a bit more on the details and certainly on the integrity of the solutions that we put forward. So thank you very much to the panel. Ben, thank you. Sabine, Fred, thank you very much. And uh, this closes our session this morning, and I'm handing over to my friend Alex. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the second panel of the second day, all about building a stronger Europe. On the 24th of February, Russia invaded Ukraine. And unfortunately, today we have a war taking place in Europe. The dramatic geopolitical context gives a whole new dimension to the Sustainability Summit. In an increasingly unstable world, our societies won't be able to conduct the deep transformation needed to meet our climate and energy transition objectives without an integrated, effective and coherent action by the European Union to mitigate security risks, to prevent conflicts and to sustain peace. Our next roundtable will ask the question, what is the role of the European defence and security sector in setting the conditions to help us deliver our sustainability ambitions? To tackle these questions, I'm delighted to introduce you to our fantastic panel. Let's start first with virtually connected the State Secretary of Defence and the German Federal Ministry of Defence, Simtje Möller. Frau Staatssekretärin, hello. Hi. Also very pleased to introduce you to the Director of Foreign Policy at the Centre for European Reform, Ian Bond. Hello, Ian. And the Distinguished Policy Fellow at the European Council on Foreign Relations and until very recently the NATO's Assistant Secretary General for Defence Investment, Camille Grand. Bonjour. Hello. And to my left, the CEO of Abbas Defence and Space, Mike Scholhan. Hi, everybody. State Secretary of Defence, um, I would like to start with a question for you. Um, one year ago, it would have seemed far-fetched that we host a panel specifically on the link between defence and sustainability in Europe, and to find such widespread agreement that both are absolutely fundamentally important. Has there been a paradigm shift in thinking, especially on national level, on the importance of defense in protecting our values and our democracies? Well, that's a simple answer. Of course, it has changed because we have a lot of public interest at the moment and a public debate and discussion on security. People have realized, especially in Germany, after years and decades that they were quite a bit reluctant to security and armed forces there. So we have an, an abundantly clear need of armed forces and uh, securing our own territory, securing our own values, but also NATO territory. So we have uh, observed a clear um, shift in the interest and also in the public debate. We see a lot of the great majority of, the, of German people is in favor of armed forces, also in favor of uh, raising the financial budget for defense. So we see a strong support, so meaning that um, the settlement already happened in the minds of German people, and this is what we're working for, that we secure values, that we secure to the Germany and also NATO territory. Thank you. Mike, um, the crisis in the Ukraine has really relegated the debate on defence and the respectability of the defence industry um, to the background. There seems to have been a collective awakening, as you also said, Madam State Secretary, on the importance of defence in protecting our values and our democracy. From an industry perspective, what is your point of view? Do you agree with that? 
Well, if, if I look at the question uh, as you pose it, then my short answer would be yes, there's been a change, clearly. And the importance of defense and security and safety uh, has been re-recognized. Um, but let me maybe give it a bit more color, because um, probably only a year ago, when I took over my job in the summer of, of last year, my first uh, difficult job was to jump at this uh, discussion that was ongoing pretty violently or vividly, let's say, uh, in terms of um, the so-called social taxonomy, where the defense industry as a whole was sort of stigmatized as being non-sustainable, at least on the path of, of, of that happening. So that, of course, was not something that, that, we, that we liked, as you would imagine. But it was a difficult stance that we had in terms of um, explaining that defense and safety are not, is not the opposite of sustainability. But I would agree that probably a year ago, having a summit that discusses defense under the headline of sustainability would have probably been a daunting task. Now, many things have changed through the war, through all the things that have happened since. Um, the so-called social taxonomy is somewhat in, you know, I will say, somewhat put in a, in a freezer, at, at least as far as, as the original intentions went. But it's still there. In the finance industry, there is still a, a, a pretty much unchanged definition of what is sustainable business that, that is encouraged to be invested into. And defense is still not recognized there. We're now in the gray zone, if you will. Uh, we're, we're sort of neutral. And maybe there's no, no easy path to, to declaring us sustainable. But we, the whole external discussion triggered an internal discussion in Airbus, also in terms of, OK, why are we in defense as Airbus? We have a large civil business. We have helicopters for civil purposes. But we also have a as you probably know, 20% around of our overall turnover going into defense. That can not only be driven by synergies, technical synergies from military air systems to, to civil or, or commercial air systems. It goes back to two things in my view. One is a values piece, um, and that was very pronounced and coming up in discussions also with our teams. It's the same values with which we defend the planet or help defend the planet and call it sustainability that we want to defend and help defend our democracies in our countries and our people. So that's the, that's the values aspect of it. And the other aspect is a very practical one. You look at safety and defense and sustainability and they need to be re reinforcing each other. If you don't have a, a safe situation, if you cannot protect your prosperity, if you can't protect your people, what chances do you have to protect the planet? What means do you have to work on sustainability? And the other way around, if you don't work on sustainability, chances are through scarce water, through climate change, through uh, uh, streams of refugees, through tensions between countries and, and, and people, your level of conflict goes up, and there's a greater likelihood of, of having a, an unsafe and, and non-secure situation. So it can be looked at both ways. It can be a, a, a vicious circle if, if you don't do enough for both, but it also can be a virtuous circle. And they have, in a, in a short, and that's maybe the, the short of my long answer, they're the two sides of the same metal. They belong together. They go hand in hand. Thank you, Mike. Um, Ian, a question for you. Um, we have this discussion because of the unfortunate situation in the Ukraine. You are a, a renowned expert on Russia and also the European defense sector. Um, several elements. What do you think what needs to happen to end this war? Um, what are the lessons we need to learn from this contact, uh, conflict? Um, and is it also that we need to build more re resilience in Europe? So, yeah, I mean, first of all, I, I would say that um, what Mike has just said, uh, I, I thought he must have been reading the notes that I had written myself before this, uh, this session, um, because it does seem to me that we're at the end of a rather naive assumption in Europe that um, you didn't need to worry about defence. Uh, what happened on the 24th of February actually shouldn't have come out of a clear blue sky. Um, 
but uh, it, it, it certainly um, was uh, a defining moment. Um, and I think if we're thinking about uh, sustainability, it's got to be built on a, a foundation of our own security. I mean, putting it very bluntly, I don't suppose that there are many people in Ukraine now who are thinking about climate change uh, because they have rather more immediate concerns. And I think we have to be able to preserve our security to deter the kinds of conflicts that might arise uh, within Europe. Um, and that is always going to involve the defence sector. Now, uh, turning to the question of uh, how do we end this war, uh, I mean, the, the answer to that is we, we end this war by defeating Russia. Um, now, I, I know that, uh, you know, there's been a lot of speculation in recent weeks about do we need to have a negotiations process starting already and so on. Uh, I think we should look at the experience of the, the last, not just the last eight years, but the, the last 14 years since Russia attacked Georgia in 2008. And we should ask ourselves whether negotiations have brought security. Uh, and regrettably, the answer is they haven't. Uh, Putin has taken each round of, of talks, whether that was um, uh, former French President Sarkozy's talks with Russia over the, uh, the cessation of hostilities in Georgia in 2008, or the Minsk agreements of 2014 and 2015 in, uh, in Ukraine, Putin has taken each of these processes as um, an opportunity for a pause, for rebuilding, and then to go on and to, uh, to start again. Um, so, I think it's very important that we are realistic this time uh, that unless Russia is decisively defeated, and I don't mean by that, you know, that we see the Ukrainian flag flying over the Kremlin, um, but that Russia is not in a position to relaunch um, an attack either on Ukraine or on any other neighboring country uh, in the foreseeable future. Uh, then it's very hard to see without that how you ever achieve peace in Europe. Uh, and in terms, of, in terms of the lessons learned, um, I mean, it seems to me that, that uh, there, are, there are four things that I think Europe needs at this stage. Uh, the first is constantly reappraising risks. So, the, the EU's strategic compass, which um, sets out actually quite a good plan for what Europe is going to do in the defence sector over the next few years, that was based on uh, a threat assessment done towards the end of 2021. Notwithstanding that, by the time that the strategic compass was published in March, it was already out of date. So you need a constant process of, of um, appraising and updating your, your risks. Um, you need uh, a good understanding of the tools that you have for tackling the risks that you see. So whether that is um, climate risks and you need plans not only for your own green transition, but also for helping other countries to make the green transition. Um, but you need an appreciation of the tools that you have, military and political and economic. Third, you need plans and resources. Uh, now, the German government is committing quite a lot of new money to defence. Um, but, uh, you know, I have questions over um, whether, against the background of the economic problems that we're seeing, all of the countries in Europe are going to stick to the commitments that they have made to spend, spend more on, on defence on the basis of the plans that they've drawn up. Um, and when I look at the, the strategic compass and also at um, NATO's strategic concept, you know, they look very good on paper, but I want to be able to come back in five years and see whether the money's actually been invested, and that's very important. And the last thing that I want to say, and, and I've alluded to this already, is Europe needs a learning culture. Um, it needs to be able to learn from its own mistakes. So, um, 
And, I mean, mea culpa is very good. Um, I have to say that uh, I, I was very impressed that the um, German justice minister admitted what a colossal mistake continued German support for Nord Stream 2 had been uh, in contributing to the, to the background to the current war. But actually, we need a more general learning culture uh, in which you're constantly looking at what have you done right and what have you done wrong, and putting right the latter. And I think too often um, in Europe, and I include my own country in this, even though we're outside the EU, we're still in Europe, um, we congratulate ourselves on the things that we do well. We fail to learn the lessons from the things we do badly. To build on what Ian just said, there were two elements I would be interested to hear from you, Camille. First of all, Ian just talked about the strategic compass and you were deeply involved when you have worked for the NATO. So um, I think everyone would be interested um, if you can elaborate a little bit more what have been the discussion on EU level to tackle those challenges when talking about the strategic compass. and. Um, to also make the bridge from um, th this term of the learning culture in this five years to be a little bit provocative. What do we need to learn in Europe maybe in five years so that we can defend ourselves with, without the help of the U US? Uh, first of all, I, I would very much echo what has been said with, with my, by my three uh, co-panelists on, on the fact that we are indeed in a defining moment. Um, I'm uh, uh, using the image of saying that I, I believe that the 24th of February is more important for the Europeans than 9-11 was for, 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 for Europe at least. Meaning that it opens a brand new chapter in, in, uh, in our security history, probably a generational change, and meaning that it has con uh, very, very important and deep consequences for, for our um, military, uh, for the way we operate, for the way we need to think about security and defense. And, and uh, this is something that is true for all Europeans, even if there might be uh, nuances in how uh, deep is, is that, that feeling uh, across, across the continent. Uh, what's interesting, and, and you were referring to the strategic compass and NATO strategic concept, is that both organizations have been adapting at a fairly fast pace um, uh, in, in, in light of the, the, these events. Uh, they've been doing things that w were quite unprecedented, and this is really um, interesting to note, um, uh, um, both in terms of deterrence and defense, and that is more in NATO's lane, but uh, there are now 40,000 troops uh, um, uh, on the eastern flank of the alliance under uh, uh, SACUR's uh, uh, direct command, which is a, a something that hadn't happened in Europe since uh, uh, the Cold War. Uh, there are um, uh, uh, large uh, uh, amounts of combat and combat-ready troops uh, coming from uh, France and Germany in, in countries where we were not uh, stationed before, whether we're talking about Slovakia or Romania. Uh, and this is really uh, quite significant. And a large portion of the deterrence and, and defense effort is brought by uh, European forces uh, uh, next to uh, the American contribution to that. Um, it also involved reviewing the strategic documents. Uh, you, you mentioned the strategic compass and, and, uh, this, uh, and NATO's own strategic concept, which are documents which are reviewed uh, not that often. Uh, they had to be reviewed in a time of crisis, which is always demanding. Uh, but I think they were, uh, they sort of recognized the, the depth of the change that uh, we, are, uh, we are facing. Um, of course, those documents are more, are more of a policy nature, so now it, uh, as um, Ian was just saying, they, they need to be sort of, uh, um, all the, the devil is in the implementation and the level of ambition that follows on that. So what does that mean in practice? Um, that we need to continue to accelerate the change that have been taking place. Some of it started before, the 24th of February, but has been deeply accelerated. So whether it's about defense spending, so it's the NATO 2% target, which I always stress is also combined with a 20% uh, uh, share of the defense budget uh, devoted to investment. And the two things go hand in hand. Uh, you, you know, if, if you do spend more, it's also about spending better and investing in the, in the, in the future in capabilities, in research and development and all of that. It's a reviewed defense posture. And the lesson is that contrary to a common belief, 
um, collective defense is more demanding than uh, operations uh, abroad, even in, in theaters as far as Afghanistan. What I mean by that is that um, when you go to Afghanistan, you do have the luxury of uh, choosing how much efforts you want to devote, uh, to prepare for the mission, uh, uh, a few thousand soldiers that will be deployed. Collective defense from that perspective is more demanding financially, it's more demanding from a military standpoint, and it's more demanding in terms of readiness and in terms of technology because you're looking at peer uh, potential adversaries. So, so that means uh, really continuing, continuously adapting our system. Um, for, on the EU side, what has been interesting is that the EU has been, in my view, quite successfully using the EU uh, it toolbox. Uh, there is a, a in, in one of the tools is this so-called so peace facility, uh, which for the first time has been used to actually buy weapons, uh, uh, which uh, seems a bit odd, uh, you know, given the branding of the, 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 the tool. But is it very interesting to see that a tool that was initially targeted at training peacekeepers and, uh, and, and local forces uh, in, in a crisis management environment has now been devoted to uh, the purchase of equipment to support Ukraine and to replenish the stocks of, of, of uh, uh, EU member states. Um, the, there is also a, a broadening of the effort on, through the European Defence Fund and the other tools that support uh, industry to incentivize uh, um, acquisition in, in common and joint co and cooperation amongst the uh, EU member states and, and beyond, by the way, which uh, uh, will make a difference when it comes to um, R&D and also uh, um, uh, to a degree when it comes to um, making the backfilling of capacities faster. So, in a way, uh, we face a, a, a rough future, and there is, as Ian alluded to, there is no easy outcome to the Ukrainian uh, war, uh, uh, and there is no going back to normal, I would argue, uh, uh, in sight. Uh, so we have to prepare for this, and from that perspective, what is uh, demanding, and, and demanding for the, the, the political uh, leaders, uh, is really to, at the same time, address immediate requirements, so backfilling uh, stocks, buying the right spare parts to have the right level of readiness and, and that sort of thing. Rebuilding a military that is fit for purpose in a, in a, in a, a complicated environment and preparing the future. And all things go hand in hand. So you can't, you can't ignore one at the expense of the others, otherwise you're sort of missing uh, uh, the depth of the challenge that we're facing. And to, to close my, my to, to sort of this point with a, uh, uh, the, the sustainability debate, what I would very much stress is that sustainability uh, you know, starts with security. If you don't have a secure environment, it is extraordinarily difficult to, to, uh, uh, to work on, on, uh, on, on fighting the consequences of uh, climate change. Uh, and uh, in, in that environment, I think it is really important and that the Europeans, who have been a, for a long time a bit naive, you, you know the image about herbivores in a world of carnivores, uh, uh, about, about, uh, about security issues, uh, are now uh, really taking this uh, um, uh, shift towards a, a, a more demanding environment, which means that they, they also need to have the means to defend themselves and to be a full part of, of, this, of, this, uh, of this conversation for the, for the future, including when it comes to the, the key technologies that will ensure uh, our security tomorrow. Thank you. Um, State Secretary Müller, I know that you have to leave us very soon, but before you go, um, as we have now heard different perspectives from an industry side, but also uh, European Union and NATO, um, can you please give us a little bit of insights? What are the next steps of the, the German government? Um, where do we stand with the famous German Zeitenwende? And, and what are Germany's plans for a more European collaboration? Well, first of all, let me state that the Zeitelman is not a, a certain point of time, but it's more a, a sta state of mind, because uh, the Zeitelman didn't happen when Chancellor Scholz just simply pronounced the word. It has to happen, it happens uh, since then, and ha it has to um, also lead us for the future. Because what we have to do is that we have to, clearly, we have to change security and defense politics, 
and also investment in in the Bundeswehr um, as it was before. We have to change it completely and we have to get also the training point. That is why we have the special fund. The Bundestag now voted on the special funds so that we can, on, on the budget and, and as such, so that we now can go on and start working, working with or start our work with investments and also um, the detailed negotiations with the industry. So it seems quite simple. Now you have the money and everybody knows that we have to invest in, into Bundeswehr and the capabilities, but it's not that, uh, that simple. I think everybody in the, uh, of the panel knows that you that just cannot simply push a button and then you have new tanks, new uh, fighter jets or new ships. You have to negotiate with the industry, also the industry um, pay the tribute to the peace dividend, meaning that also we have shrinked uh, industry capabilities and now everybody has to enforce and put their efforts together so that we can meet the goals that we, I think, in the end we all share. Meaning uh, uh, a sustainable in terms of uh, de defense cap capacities and capabilities, a sustainable Bundeswehr so that we can defend uh, Germany and also NATO territory. So this is the shared goal by all, all of us. And we have to bundle and put all our efforts together that we meet this goal, meaning that also the industry has to find out where the um, cap capacities can be enhanced. Um, that they can be built up, raised up, so that we meet um, also the expectations that the poli uh, politics has. Um, and then we have to find out where the shortfalls are. We have, uh, we, we did go through um, the planning. We, get, we made the rounds with NATO, with the European Union. We have the different instruments, um, the card, but also a deeper. We have in the compass, we have different in instruments so that we can find out together um, or found out together where the shortcuts are, um, where the capabilities on European soil are, how we can meet them. For example, one of the initiatives um, to me uh, to erase the, the shortfall in air defense was NC, the European Skyship Initiative um, brought up by Chancellor Scholz and Clark, so that uh, now uh, more than uh, about 15 other countries joined this initiative so that we can secure uh, the, the air space and the air dimension um, of Europe. So this is something that we everybody has to meet. The work starts now since the budget has been voted on uh, in the Bundestag and it will be quite long. I think also one of the pillars of defense in the future will be to strengthen cooperation within Europe. Um, I know that Airbus is one of the one of our uh, promoters of uh, Franco-German, uh, but also Franco-German-Spanish uh, cooperation. You're working um, quite strong on the on the APCAS. Everybody is observing very well and very uh, very tight uh, in uh, the direction and also the decisions that um, or the results that you achieved in the last weeks. So um, this is something that we, I think we, the path we have to follow because we have there, everybody knows that a strong Europe within, within the European pillar of NATO, meaning means that we have a sovereign Europe um, and more capabilities to defend Europeans, to defend Europe as such, and the values that we stand for. And at the same time, we spend um, the money that, is, uh, that we, we tend, we spend tax funds um, and the money that is uh, from from all European countries more efficiently. This is something that we definitely has, have to do. And also, if you then look in cooperation and the possibilities and opportunities that you gain from it, you can have a lot of innovation. This is that's not then not only for the sake of the defense industry and the security of all of us, but for example, also possibly for in, in other indus, industrial sectors. For example, also in, uh, in terms of sustainability, because if you invest in innovation in defense industry, for example, you can implement what we did so that you have um, sustainable uh, fuels um, also in in, in, air, in, in air material. In the air dimension, then you can um, you can hopefully spread this idea to other uh, and on, also in the civilian sector. So I think in the end, is uh, for the sake of for, for all of us, and um, the work starts now. We have to 
fulfill this site in Vendor so that in the end we stand, um, we uphold to the, in this new security environment and to the fact that it is now at the eastern border of NATO territory. Thank you, State Secretary Müller. Thank you very much for joining us. It was a pleasure, really much appreciated. Mm -hmm. We wish you a very good rest of the day. And again, thank you very much for joining. Thank you very much. Um, Mike, uh, State Secretary also talked about the collaboration future projects. Um, from an industry perspective, what do you think are the lessons learned, not only for defense, but maybe also for space, because the topic also goes up uh, to the space from what we have now seen with the war in Ukraine? Well, very good question, and probably could, could trigger a long discussion, but let me, let me try to be brief. And, and the discussion that I'm having with, with air chiefs and with, with lots of experts is still ongoing, so the learning continues, but I think there's some early uh, lessons learned that, that we need to take to heart. Um, for one, I would say, while this looks like very much a, a land war, it's also a land war because nobody has air dominance. Otherwise, it would look differently. So there is still, uh, let's say, a necessity to, to dominate the air because then you can command much more of what's happening in the overall domains. The second piece that we all witnessed, partly on, on, on the news, was uh, the importance of space. Uh, Earth observation, I mean, the Russian troops marching towards Kiev uh, were visible from satellites, and satellite imagery gave a, a very good warning, actually. We could have, we saw the masses of troops on the Ukrainian border early on. Uh, that's one aspect of space. The other one is um, secure communications. When uh, the connectivity or the, the communication means of Ukraine were diminished by cyber attacks. It was the constellation uh, of Starlink that helped reestablish secure communications for Ukraine. So that's only two aspects of the importance of space. I give you a third one. Uh, President Putin, in the midst of, of this war, when he witnessed that Europe was much more united and, and, and the West was more united, uh, he threatened that if you continue to support Ukraine, I might attack your satellites. Um, so, like it or not, and it doesn't really fit to the, let's say, relatively positive and maybe sometimes naive vision of the past, space has become a battle domain. And that needs to be recognized in, in our technologies, in our collaboration, Within Europe, that's why it's so important that Europe has decided for their own secure constellation called Iris Square. Meanwhile, it has had many names in between. Um, and that's why we need to reinforce our space capabilities, not only for sustainability, which they have a great usage for that too, but also for defense purposes. That's, that's one aspect. The other one is, uh, and Camille just uh, spoke to that, collective defense. Um, notably at a peer level, is something different than conflict uh, in, in, in Afghanistan or in Africa. Collective defense requires connectivity and interoperability. So you take all this together, um, I think it's a strong reinforcement for what we want to accomplish between Spain, France and Germany with FCAS. It is about connectivity, it's about network-centric capabilities to win in a battle. It's, of course, about stealth and electronic warfare as well, so that's why we're very happy that the Eurofighter has been selected by Germany as the platform for, for, Euro, for electronic warfare. Um, and it's about the multi-domain aspect of it all. Um, so, so everything in that direction, and FCAS is a, is a summarizing um, word for it, goes in the right direction. Unmanned drones playing a big role. Now, as much as drones have been effective, the counter-drone activities have been effective as well. So being superior in the unmanned domain, being flexible, being adaptive, learning fast, erecting quick C2 networks, command and control networks, acting, moving, that's all extremely important as we've learned. And, and maybe lastly, I would put something that's, that's more... Um, 
more coming from the, from the blurred or the hybrid aspects of this war, cyber, uh, we saw cyber attacks and still see them. Um, everything, almost everything has been weaponized um, from civil infrastructure. Uh, talked about space, we saw what happened to, uh, to the gas pipelines. Um, so the aspects of, of having a greater resilience across everything, being more collective and holistic in, in our approaches, and then also recognizing that this is also part of defense, and Europe needs to not be one-sidedly dependent on something like Russian gas is a part of defense. I extrapolate that to not being one-sidedly dependent on another country for its own capabilities around defense, especially around software intensive and, and, and information intensive things. So Europe needs to watch out with all the justification and all the, the, the right reasons why now depleted stocks need to be replenished, that we don't make ourselves dependent on the US, on, on, on other technologies that we don't master enough ourselves. So that's why if there is a need to apply something, to buy something that's not American, at least it needs to be interoperable. It cannot be a black box. It needs to be connectable to, to European capabilities. And we need to, we need to sort of master and, and, and not uh, just accept it as something that, that is only partially under our control. So the European sovereignty part of defense is something that is, I think, an, an equal learning from the situation in Ukraine. Don't make ourselves dependent or unilaterally dependent on one power or one force, even if it's a partner. Thank you, Mike. And um, we will have to soon close the panel, but you brought up an interesting point about space as the new battle domain. Um, and I would be interested to quickly hear from our two experts. Um, what is your point of view um, on that? Is this really also, from your perspective, a new frontier of conflict? And do you believe that the European Union and NATO have this even on their radar and can tackle these challenges, which Mike has just outlined to us? Camille, maybe um, you would like to maybe, start. Maybe to, to start on, on that. First of all, um, it's not by chance that NATO recognized space as a domain of operation not so long ago and is establishing a, 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 a space command within air command. Uh, there, there is a, a, the recognition that we have both vulnerabilities and opportunities in space, uh, that we are heavily dependent on, on our uh, uh, space assets and probably more dependent than some of our potential adversaries and that therefore we really need to be more resilient in space, uh, which means uh, a number of things. Uh, first of all, and there is a very interesting conversation, uh, transatlantic conversation that I've witnessed over the last 20 years between GPS and Galileo, uh, where we've seen the Americans moving from a position of saying, why are you duplicating this asset to this is good because this is adding resilience uh, to, to, uh, to the West uh, in, in a way. Uh, and this is uh, when uh, efforts at uh, GPS jamming, GPS spoofing are, are a, a, a very big part of the toolbox uh, used uh, by countries like Russia. So, so this is really uh, of critical importance. But what I would say is that those space assets are both increasingly vulnerable and it is in important and as Mike just did to uh, uh, be reminded you know we discuss a lot about how diminished as have been the Russian forces and this is true in the land domain they've uh, uh, engaged more forces than they probably thought they would and uh, and they've taken severe losses but in the air maritime outer space cyber you know, hybrid capacities, th th this is not the case. So we might very much well see part of that competition and the risks evolve in those, uh, in those directions, which, in which we are, um, in, in a way, uh, uh, um, uh, we need to be more resilient and more capable of addressing those, those challenges. So that's, that's really an important, um, I wouldn't call it a battlefield per se, but a, a field of competition. And we also see that as we are speaking, you know, the Chinese were, are uh, developing at a super fast pace their uh, uh, space program. 
uh, they, they, they've been you know, expanding it uh, uh, on a, uh, at a rhythm which we haven't necessarily paid enough attention mm -hmm. to. Uh, and this is something that I think is a very big challenge for Europe, both in the civilian and in the military domain. Thank you. Ian, what is your quick take on that? Yeah, so I, I would very much agree with, uh, with Camille. I mean, we, we had seen already that both um, China and Russia had anti-satellite capabilities. Now, you know, there is a risk to both of them in employing those um, because they can also damage satellites that they, they need. But I mean, as Camille says, we probably depend on these things more than they do. Um, and so that does create a vulnerability. What I was also going to say is, you know, it's not just space, which is a, a new domain of, uh, of conflict, but also the undersea area. Mm. Um, so there's been some concern about the severing of various um, fiber optic <laughs> links beneath <laughs> the, uh, the seas, um, breaking off communications. Um, <coughs> we know that the Russians have that capability. Uh, the British government is certainly looking to build new ships uh, to be able to counter some of, the, uh, of that and to be able to defend some of the... Um, uh, the undersea infrastructure that we have. But I think, you know, we have to look at a threat to, to our critical national infrastructure, which stretches from the bottom of the ocean to our satellites in orbit, and to be able to provide ourselves with resilience and with defense measures at every, at every level. Thank you very much. Before we now move on to our Q&A, Mike, as the CEO of Airbus Defence and Space, do you have any thoughts now after having listened to so many different voices? Well, I heard a lot of uh, a common thread between the different voices. I think, uh, I think the message that, that was coming across, hopefully loud and clear, is that not only is defence needed, but defence is not the opposite of sustainability. It actually contributes to sustainability and is a bedrock of sustainability. That's maybe one thing, and I think we need to have that debate in the public because it's been, it's been led for too long time in a one-sided way. Um, and I, in, arguably, um, one could come to the conclusion that when Putin made his situational awareness, will I attack or will I not attack, the discussion that was ongoing in Europe the, let's say, naive view of defense capabilities um, and the fact that uh, we had a discussion around defense being not sustainable probably added to his picture that the West is weak and is in a sort of a decay. And that is something that we can only change when we have an active discourse with our people, with the population and the public. I think it's well worth it. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now moving to the Q&A. First of all, many thanks to our panelists. Um, for the Q&A, it's the usual approach. Dear online viewers, you can ask um, via the Q&A functionality. Here in the room, please raise your hand. Microphones is around. Please state your name and the publication you work for just right here. Josh, how are your current? Uh, hearing you know, a lot of conversation about you know, Nord Stream 2 and the, and the dependence on uh, Russian oil and gas and sort of the, the inherent economic ties between uh, Europe and Russia and sort of what that meant going into the, into the conflict. I, I'm, I'm quite curious from the perspective of what somewhat looks like a bit of a paradox, which is the continued purchase of Russian titanium by, by Airbus, which ultimately is being used for their industry to build SU-30s, SU-35s, you know, weapons that are being used in, in Ukraine for uh, the financing of, of that through the through Russian titanium industry. Is there not an inherent paradox in that as well relative to what seems to be a rather unsustainable dynamic that ultimately bolsters their military capability through the purchase of commercial titanium? I guess that question goes to me, right? Um, well, it is true, and I think we've, we've, we've explained that for the time being, ABBA still procures a certain percentage of Russian titanium, but clearly on a track of becoming independent of it. Uh, on the military side, we have done the homework. We don't need any more Russian titanium. On the commercial side, we still have 
um, a short while until we, we need to sort of transition into non-Russian sources. That is not a small feat in, in terms of all the certification, the second sources that everybody jumps on right now, but it's in full swing, and it, it's a temporary thing uh, with clearly the aim to not be dependent on Russian titanium. If I could, if I could just add, add one, one point, because I think your, your, your question is raising um, one of the lessons of this conflict. Uh, I was uh, very deeply involved in trying to understand the the, how do we rebuild uh, our uh, um, uh, defense capacity and how, the, uh, how is industry capable of delivering uh, there? That has put a pretty crude light on, 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 on the various bottlenecks that exist. Uh, it's not only about cash, it's also about access to raw material, including from uh, regions or countries that are sensitive. It's about access, it's about the workforce, it's about uh, the ability to be able to uh, have some of the critical components in the supply chain. So a lot of questions that have been asked and, and what industry, the defense industry has been struggling with in the, in the, uh, in the last few months in order to meet demand for replenishing stocks and enable, therefore, uh, um, allies and, and EU member states to help assist Ukraine and meet their requirements is a demanding job. It's, you know, and, and a lot of those debates which had been a bit put aside have, have appeared in a very, very crude light, uh, just as the one you highlighted. Thank you. There was a question. Uh, question from Mike. Dominic Perry from Flight Global. Uh, and this is around your solid point. <laughs> Given the number of acquisitions from US defense companies, particularly F-35, but also P-8, Apache for Germany, possibly. Is Germany particularly, and Europe more generally, doing enough to support its own defense aerospace industry? That's a nice tee up. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me, be, let me be as unbiased as I can. Um, Still, my short answer would be no, not currently. I think there's a lot of good momentum. Camille talked about many of the European programs that are set up to cover both short-term needs, to also look into technology development, and incentivize the teaming up of, of more than one or two or three um, European nations. So there's a lot of things that, that are in flux and that are in the making. Now, some countries are, as, as you know, in, in, the, in, the, in the crunch need of, of trying to fill their uh, stocks or their depleted capabilities as quickly as possible. And then some countries, and, and especially Germany, has come to the conclusion uh, for the nuclear role of, of the tornado, they want to go with F-35s. Well, there would have been alternatives. But the, the problem was the decision was kicked down the road for such a long time that the timeline to get it done and certify the US uh, nuclear bomb on a Eurofighter would have been almost impossible to accomplish. So that, 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 there's a logic. There's another logic that, that one can agree with, at least as a, as a snapshot in time. If Europe has no large transport helicopter, Germany buys um, a Chinook, a CH-46. Now, if you look at it more in long term, why is that? It's because the mistakes were made 10 years ago. And that's the crux of it by now just, you know, going overboard with buying American. You, you buy yourself into a liability for the next 10 or 20 and 30 years into not strengthening your own industry enough. And that's why we're fighting as the European, as the German uh, aerospace industry to if you buy already US or other non-European platforms, at least involve us in the maintenance, in the sustaining, in the connectivity, uh, because that's then where sovereignty starts, uh, to, to, to independently operate these platforms and not be dependent on, on US maintenance facilities or, or get in line with the needs of the US. So I think it's an it's a extremely important question um, and again, coming to my short answer, I think there's more to be done. I think the recognition is developing, um, but it is part of the Zeit and Wende of the, of the shift of the mindset in terms of, okay, um, 
that also needs to be strengthened and needs to be enabled. I pr quickly bring in also a question from our online viewers, Ian, one for you. Um, how likely do you think a Russian war of aggression on NATO territory is in the foreseeable future? I think it's quite unlikely um, as long as we have strong defenses and strong deterrence and you know the strategic concept which Camille was involved in very much um, really sets that out quite clearly. Uh, my concern is that if there is any sense of, of um, weakness in NATO's posture and especially in political will then uh, this becomes more of a risk. Um, you know, nothing provokes Putin uh, and people of Putin's um, psychological type in Russia, um, nothing provokes them as much as weakness. Um, so it seems to me that as long as you keep your defences and your deterrence in good order, you haven't got very much to worry about. Um, the moment that you begin to suggest that, you know, maybe um, not all NATO territory is defensible, uh, you have a serious problem. Thank you. I think there was in the middle. Yeah, Lois, I see you. Hi, I'm Sylvia Fyfe from the FT. I just had a follow-up question to John's, to Mike, please. Um, the Ukrainians are asking for more munitions and more equipment, but the West isn't able to supply them fast enough. And I just wondered um, why have governments not been fast enough at placing new contracts with industry? Um, you know, and how does Europe break the bottleneck to kickstart production? What are you looking for and why are you not getting it? Thanks. Well, maybe as a first comment, I would say, we don't produce ammunition at Airbus, but of course I'm, I'm somewhat involved in these discussions, so, so I, can, I can try to uh, give my input to that question. Um, I don't think it's, it's the same across the board. I think uh, some countries are actually um, filling up their ammunition um, stocks quite effectively. Maybe not as fast as they would like to, but, but at, at least they, they, um, they make progress, they get orders out, they, they order ammunition and, and it gets... Uh, um, the demand signal gets fulfilled. Um, and other countries are still struggling a bit with, with their procurement processes that, that have been, uh, you know, built over many years to, to not create a big throughput and not enable a big th throughput, and it's still a bit um, in the making of how they can be accelerated. Um, there's sometimes the, the request also coming, coming well, readable in the newspapers of a wartime economy, which, which, which we, of course, as industry, also ask ourselves, what can we contribute? I mean, the first thing that we did was, uh, on the spot, ramp up our, our MRO capabilities, because we knew there would be more flight hours now with Eurofighters, with A400Ms. Uh, we covered weekends, we covered 724. That worked pretty well. Um, now, when it comes to large investments, uh, moving from ammunition maybe to, to, to other platforms, land, uh, sea, air. You don't necessarily need a purchase order, but you need some information to, to start your planning. So what does that mean? What is the capacity needed? Uh, what volumes? Over what time? And that, I think, is something that is still being digested in terms of what do we want? What can we afford? Um, not helped by, by the current inflation, by all the things that the countries re wrestle with in their budgets. So it, it is not a seamless process. I think it's, it's part of that bigger change of, of moving from a very peacetime oriented. Um, actually, if we are a bit slow, that's actually pretty good kind of process and, and system to something like, wow, and now it's really important, it has to go fast. Uh, we're in it, we, we, we will contribute. Uh, Camille, you want to add? No, just, just chipping in on this conversation because I, I, I have been quite involved in it. Uh, first of all, supporting Ukraine is possible. I think we shouldn't 
fall into a narrative that the um, uh, or um, uh, ministries of, of defense or military and or industries incapable of doing this in the short term. It is doable. The, uh, even the, ex the massive extent of the support provided to Ukraine only is a fraction of our defense budget. Uh, so so that, that is important to keep in mind to not get carried away by the conversation about the, the true bottlenecks that exist. Second point is that there needs to be a real dialogue between governments, institutions that need to provide the right demand signal and contracts and good understanding of what the market can uh, deliver uh, on the one hand and industry on the other hand which is not only asking for money but also a clear understanding of how long this is going to last and how big is the demand going to be. And then the, the last thing to your question is really there are vast differences between the different types of weapons, whether the more complex the weapon system. Uh, uh, so if you're moving from artillery shells to um, air defenses, uh, the ability to produce them o overnight is, of course, somewhat different. Uh, and it means that there, uh, the reliability on the supply from existing stocks is more important, and the ability to rebuild these stocks at pace is becoming very critical. Yeah. Sorry, can I just? Yeah. I, I just wanted to add one thing, which is that I think there's also a question about the the tolerance for risk of our own governments. Um, there is a massive difference between Estonia, which actually is one of the most exposed states, uh, which has spent something more than a third of its defence budget um, on supplies for Ukraine. Um, and some of the countries more west, which uh, you know, you might say are keeping their powder dry, um, are you know quite reluctant to draw down their stocks to that extent. Um, and I think we have to ask ourselves um, just what what kind of adversary is it that we think uh, in the UK or France or Germany we're preserving our stocks for. Um, because you know there is actually a war going going on, and um, it, it seems to me that we're too too much thinking. Well, you know, we need to keep a, a lot back for a rainy day. The rainy day is right now. Thank you. Here in the front. Hi, thank you, Tim Hoover from Reuters. Um, just following up on titanium, could you tell us a little bit more precisely how long Airbus will need Russia? When do you expect the last? shipment to be? Are you talking months, years? And more broadly, perhaps, how uh, importantly does this panel expect access to strategic raw materials like that, um, as well as rare earths, that type of thing, to weigh in the future? And um, second question, how likely do you feel, how much of a risk is there of a uh, decoupling from China and what are the strategic and security implications of that as opposed to economic? Mike, do you want to go? Yeah, back, back to the titanium question. Um, uh, as, I, as I tried to explain before, uh, we're in the process of decoupling from Russia when it, when it comes to titanium. It will be a matter of months, not years. Uh, I cannot give you a precise um, date. Uh, it's a relatively complex process with certification and everything else that aviation calls for, uh, but it'll, it'll happen. Um, as far as, maybe I'll start with the, the other questions, as far as the um, general question of access to raw materials and critical supplies, I think there is a need, and it's been recognized uh, in Europe, that we need to do more in terms of being more resilient. Now. Um, not criticizing, for instance, the, the EU CHIP Act, uh, which, which I think is an important step as one example, but it's, it's, it needs to go beyond in terms of the chips that are actually needed by also the defense industry, which, which are not these types of chips. So I think there's more to be done. I think every company is now um, analyzing their, their supply chain to the tier N as much as we can have visibility. Uh, but in the end, it's also a national and a, a pan-European approach to say, where do we see the greatest risks? What do we think we can do ourselves, either in Europe or by nearshoring or, or by, by uh, finding other sources? It's something that is a question of, if, if risk management ever had a, had a meaning, it's, it's now for, for this type of thing. 
Kami Ian. Yeah, I mean, just quickly on the um, on the China issue. I mean, I think this is this really is quite crucial. Um, decoupling it would be extremely difficult for the global economy. Um, but whether we want to do it or not, um, we have to bear in mind that to some extent the Chinese authorities are already doing it themselves. Uh, with Made in China 2025, with the dual circulation economy, where they're trying to separate the domestic market from the, from the international market. Um, you know, they, they are trying to minimize China's um, dependency on the West and maximize the West's dependency on China. Um, and I think in the, in the years to come, we're going to have to ask ourselves whether that is sustainable for us and for our security. Um, maybe just just two two quick thoughts. I mean, on on the issue of raw materials, I think the the, the it's not a one-sided uh, or a simple solution to 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 that in in the in, in the environment. It's so the problem is it's it's a bit like the what we learned from the COVID crisis when it came to health material. Uh, single source is not good, um, uh, so because that creates dependencies. Uh, looking at alternatives, potential alternatives, is important. The traditional policies of zero stock is probably not appropriate anymore, especially in the defense domain, because you can't, uh, uh, and that, and, but somebody has to pay for that, because that was something that, you know, where both governments and, and industry were very happy with, uh, but suddenly you're asking, if you say, please stockpile, um, you know, six months of microchips uh, to be able to not find a bottleneck, or, or stockpile a year of the titanium uh, in order to avoid bottlenecks, that, that is something that is a bit complicated. So, so those are some of the, 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 the issues. So I think it, what the moment calls is a sort of wake-up call on these issues of, of, uh, of supply chains uh, for critical material, for strategic material, as well as critical components, and how do we uh, collectively address that? And it's, it's a matter for industry, but it's also a matter for governments. On China, just one uh, thought. Uh, a, 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 a colleague of mine uses the image that um, uh, uh, Russia is the storm on us and, and China is climate change. Um, uh, uh, so, uh, uh, in, indeed, uh, the right for in the strategic realm, uh, the, you know that that is uh, that is there, and and we've never experienced to that degree the fact that. Uh, there are, you know, the U.S. And, and Europe, to a degree, recognize China as a, as a strategic rival or a systemic rival in the EU environment, while it remains a main or first trading partners for many of us. And that things needs to be thought through by, by everyone because this is unprecedented in many many ways. Um, with no, not being naive. It's not because you trade that you will be at peace forever. You know, there is a famous economist who wrote in 1913 that there was so much trade between Germany and the UK that war was impossible. And uh, it turned out not to be true. Uh, and, and the effort to bring Russia on board the global system proved not sufficient to convince Mr. Putin to not wage wars. So, so, so we should not be naive, but we should also make the effort to think through uh, this and to create the conditions that will deter uh, um, uh, the use of force. And this is where being solid on defense is probably the best way for, to preserve peace. You know, sometimes the counter arguments say, oh, you're engaged in an arms race. I would, I would counter that by saying, essentially, especially when dealing with such leaders as Mr. President Xi or President Putin, a demonstration of strength is the best way to uh, keep a form of status quo and uh, the ability to continue to operate in a relatively peaceful environment. Thank you, gentlemen. Unfortunately, we have now to close this Q&A session. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, here in Ottobrunn, we are now having a coffee break for our online viewers. We will be back at 11.30 Central European time. Again, many thanks for your active participation and especially to our panelists. Thank you for being with us today. See you later. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome back from our break, or if you're tuning in right from the start, um, this is the Airbus Summit 2022, and we are now here with our next panel, How Can UIM Be a Lifesaver? At last year's summit, Airbus unveiled its new prototype, the City Airbus Next Gen, and a lot has happened in the past year being it signing with major suppliers or partnering with key operators to develop the ecosystem which is necessary to implement it. We are here today on this panel to look at eVTOLs or electric vertical takeoff and landing from a mission perspective. And our example today is emergency medical services. To, dis to discuss this, how UAM can be a lifesaver, I'm really pleased to have with me today. First of all, the President and CEO of Government Services at International SOS, Nick Peters. Hello, Hi Nick. Ben. The Director of the Estonian Investment Agency, Invest Estonia, Jonas Vento. Hello. Hello. The Head of UM Strategy Execution and Partnership at Airbus Helicopters, Balke Sarian. Hello, Balkis. Hello, Alex. And the UM program manager at Airbus Helicopters, Hubertus Gröpper. Hi. Hello. So my first question, I think, goes to you, Balkis, and I think you definitely will pick up on that. Um, can you maybe quickly explain to us what does this mean? How can a UIM, an unmanned aerial um, mission system, be a lifesaver? What's the thinking behind? Um, and yeah, we were very interested in your introduction. Absolutely. So hello and welcome again to the Airbus Summit and the UAM moment. Uh, as Alex, you mentioned, last year at the summit, we took the opportunity to introduce you to what our product vision is. And we have affectionately named City Airbus Next Gen. City Airbus Next Gen is a culmination of all the research and development that we have done, both within the eVTOL field, but also tapping into the expertise of Airbus as a whole. And this is really where the value proposition of Airbus community and the Airbus world comes into play. In City Airbus Next Gen, our eVTOL, we have introduced a vehicle which is a four packs vehicle. She is 100% electric and she will be the first fully electric pr product that we put into the market. So this is City Airbus Next Gen. The teams have been really busy since that first introduction as well. So continuing to build not only the vehicle, securing all the suppliers from traditional automotive suppliers to new suppliers around the world to really secure what we believe will be the key components to build this first generation of our eVTOL vehicle. And we've always said from the very beginning, the vehicle is absolutely essential. We love our tech, but also when we're thinking about how we're building urban air mobility as a true service to society, we have to look beyond the vehicle as well. This means we use terms such as ecosystem. And what does the ecosystem mean for us at Airbus Urban Mobility? The ecosystem means that we will build the vehicle and we will build the surrounding components to bring this service to the citizens and the communities. For us, over the past year, if you followed our activities, we have partnered with operators from airlines to helicopter operators. We as Airbus will not operate these aircraft. We really see this as an extension of the technology and business portfolio of our operator partners. We've also created the first ever ecosystem. This is our air mobility initiative that we have launched with incredible support coming from the Bavarian German governments. And this will be the first working ecosystem. So this means an aircraft, this means an operation, this means the first use space and traffic management, first Verdi port, and the first mission demonstrations. This is how we also build and mature the technology for the ultimate service delivery. So this is what our teams have been up to over the past year or so. And if we step back now to today, so City Airbus Next Gen is an electric vehicle. So this means that it is absolutely part of the decarbonization and sustainability, summit, sustainability commitment of Airbus. Today, we'd like to take one step back and say also, as we've heard this morning a lot, sustainability goes beyond decarbonization. 
Sustainability for us is also creating social welfare, healthcare systems, building capacity. And this is where it really links in with what we believe, Alex, is the first of the key missions of such urban air mobility vehicles, medical services. Medical services create an opportunity for us that adds value to society, that complements existing medical systems, and that really tests the use cases of how eVTOLs, in this case City Airbus Next Gen, can and will be introduced to our communities. And now, Lifesaver. Lifesaver is something that we have been building for some time. I'm going to hand it over to my colleague in a moment to explain exactly what Lifesaver means. But Lifesaver is the culmination of the expertise that Airbus brings to the table with our operators. It is years of knowledge that we have gained in delivering emergency and healthcare services throughout the portfolio of Airbus products. And with our partner and co-developer International SOS and their medical and healthcare expertise, we bring together all of this capability to really create a new service to governments and communities. And we're also very, very privileged to have Estonia with us, who provides the incredible foundation of a digitally native and innovative country where we can build the next level of Lifesaver. And now I hand it over to Hubertus, Lifesaver Program Manager, to tell us exactly what it's about. Thank you, Buck. He's is very pleased to introduce today Lifesaver, a new solution, a new service by Airbus and our medical partner, International SOS, for governments worldwide that want to improve their emergency medical system. Because organizing an effective emergency response is challenging. There are so many elements that all have to work together, that have to be carefully orchestrated, from alert and dispatching to medical treatment at the scene all the way to the hospital, and using a variety of transportation means on ground, on water, and of course in the air. And this operational rescue chain is surrounded by other critical elements that are required, such as effective regulation or sustainable funding, physical and also increasingly digital infrastructure. So, Alex, this is really a complex ecosystem. And we believe that the key to a more effective emergency response, to a more efficient emergency response, is end-to-end -end integration of that ecosystem. So better integration for better patient outcomes. And that is exactly what Lifesaver is all about. So Lifesaver is designed to be a system integrator, to help governments manage this complex ecosystem and, in fact, help them build the next generation of it. And, of course, this does not come just overnight, so this takes a series of concrete operational improvement initiatives. So it's a stepwise approach, and all of these have to be aligned, have to be integrated, and have to integrate also with the overall health system. So, Governments typically would like to know where to start, which one of those changes would have the greatest impact, how to size that. And in order to answer these questions, Lifesaver combines digital technology and public health expertise and makes that available to a country on a permanent basis. So really from designed to implementation to scaling of these individual improvement initiatives. So this is really about a long-term partnership, working in the background, not operating emergency services, but integrating. So integrating the governmental side of the ecosystem with the operational side, integrating ground and air, and also integrating new innovative technologies such as the eVTOL. And the eVTOL really has a dual purpose. So first and foremost, it's adding a new capability to the system. 
But the eVTOL also has this ability to mobilize everyone in the ecosystem and to really start thinking ahead, okay, how might we use this? And what other changes can we introduce to make the overall emergency medical system better? So this is Lifesaver, and we're introducing it today. Thank you very much. And you talked both um, um, a lot about eVTOL. So the question in the room is, Will eVTOLs at a certain time replace helicopters for emergency medical services? Mm. Oh, this, this is a really good question, Alex, and one that we're faced with in many, many applications, not just emergency medical services. Today, what helicopters can provide is something completely unmatched. There is a power, there is a versatility, there is a capability, range, payload, absolute a collection of missions that uh, is quite uh, impressive that is not capable uh, to be served by eVTOLs. This is also why we consider eVTOLs a very complementary technology. What the E brings in vertical takeoff and landing is electrification. And with electrification, new market opportunities open. This means operating in urban environments where emissions and our ability to do zero emission flights with City Airbus Next Gen really provide an added value. Where noise is a factor, so in particular for medical services, urban transfers, you know, where the noise profile is so low, so the emergency operations are not restricted to only daytime operations, which is very much the case in some of the cities and communities around the world. So here, it's a perfect blend of the capability, the range that a classic helicopter provides, and the new capability that an eVTOL can add. And this is also why it's very interesting to use tools such as Lifesaver to have this holistic view, to know at a system level exactly where different technologies, air or ground or other digital technologies, can really complement each other. Thank you for this clarification. Um, you both also talked a lot about ecosystem. So let's now have a look on the ecosystem, maybe from a different perspective. And we are very happy to have you here with us, Nick. So can you maybe explain to us why improving medical services is so important now and also in the near future? And what are the different key challenges countries are facing um, around the world when it comes to deliver healthcare services. No, absolutely, Alex. And, and really what we're trying to address here is some really quite big themes in terms of global healthcare needs. And, and to, be, you know, to be very clear, we're not going to address and fix all of those with Lifesaver, but Lifesaver is a key contributor to trying to address those, those big things. And the one thing that um, is core to all healthcare systems, whether you're looking at very sophisticated developed healthcare systems or developing healthcare systems, the primary motivator is about uh, better patient outcomes. Very, very simply, um, how can you save more lives and how can you have a quality of life after a medical intervention that allows people to continue to be productive within their communities? And that's really what Lifesaver is fundamentally going to be measured against. Do we actually save more lives and do we improve the clinical outcomes in the interventions that, that, that we do. And that's really at the core of that. And that is an absolute constant uh, in, in terms of global healthcare. The other piece which Lifesaver also is seeking to try and address, because it looks at the total system and the total ecosystem, is the economic reality that we're all in. Uh, medical inflation always runs significantly ahead of general inflation, even more so in the current environment. Uh, every healthcare system is being asked to become more effective, more efficient, um, but at the same time, it's not clear how you do that. And really, one of the key premises of Lifesaver is that we'll absolutely be able to dissect the entire process end to end to actually see uh, where you can optimize the system. So how can you get uh, better outcomes, better patient outcomes, save more lives by a more effective, more efficient use of your existing resources? And then alongside that, uh, if you look at uh, everyone's recognition after COVID um, and the impact that that had on the healthcare systems. Yes, everybody wants to become more efficient and more effective, but you are going to have to make significant investment decisions. Um, but again, the challenge is which investment decisions you believe are actually really going to make a material impact. And again, Lifesaver, because it looks at the total system end to end, will start to be able to answer some of those questions. So th those precious investments actually really do 
uh, create the greatest return. And really, the other piece is around a mechanism to gain enlightenment. Um, I've been working in healthcare now for over 20 years. Uh, you sit in a room with 10 medical professionals and you'll leave the room with 25 opinions. It's just the nature of the, nature of the culture. Um, and therefore, trying to find a very disciplined process which allows scenario planning, data management, data analytics, whereby you can actually try and use that to come to a common alignment and to get the stakeholder alignment around how you want to improve the system is going to be a real sea change in this particular environment. And one of the big sort of barriers to innovation in healthcare is just simply getting people to come to a common view and common direction. So again, uh, Lifesaver is very material in that and will therefore hopefully be in, in our expectation um, a, a dynamic to help drive change uh, within emergency medical services, but change ultimately leading, uh, as, we, as I said at the beginning, uh, the primary driver of all of this is uh, improving patient outcomes and fundamentally um, saving more lives. So big, big themes uh, is really our ambition within Lifesaver. And it's a great ambition, and um, we are super lucky to have Jonas with us. Um, as bulky as you already said, Estonia is really a role model when it comes to digitalization. So we are very much interested um, if you could explain to us a little bit uh, why Estonia had now this kind of urgency, the, the sense to say, okay, let's go with LifeServer. Um, why this innovation makes sense to Estonia? What you felt? What is what? this need for improvement um, and yeah just simply tell us okay what do you think Lifesaver will bring to Estonia and what are your expectations? Yes thank you Alex uh, definitely glad to be here and uh, glad to um, go on with this um, perfect cooperation. Um, Lifesaver in initiative in Estonia is a national innovation program so uh, we, we take it uh, the over the whole nation and we our aim is to to use this innovation uh, for better patient outcomes and and of course um, the direct social benefits uh, yeah, for for Estonians so we saw that lifesaver program actually really helps us to figure this out uh, helps to see the whole picture for the EMS uh, system in Estonia and um, of course um, as you said, uh, as a digital uh, pioneer and digital country, we all the time want to make the next step, um, uh, find the new uh, innovative uh, ways to improve the, the country and the services for, for Estonians as well. But Estonia is a small country. Um, it seems like uh, you can drive really fast to the other side of Estonia, <laughs> but still there's a lot of remote uh, areas. Uh, there's uh, more than 50% of, of forest in Estonia. There are more than 2,000 islands. And um, emergency medical services really like come in handy there. Uh, and uh, through Lifesaver, we definitely can map out and figure out how we can find new ways to save people quicker and use uh, use other other ways to uh, to uh, to transportation or uh, or just to help and serve people in a medical way uh, in a better way but of course from the other side we also want to showcase what Estonia has to offer uh, and then why uh, why it's a good first uh, pilot to to do in Estonia uh, because uh, in the terms of innovation and the new technology then uh, we we are proud to say that Estonia uh, would like to um, come in in there because already right now in in Europe uh, we are uh, among the top uh, 10 innovator countries uh, in Europe and and we we Definitely like to say that, that uh, Estonia is like a living lab for, for this kind of practical innovations and practical new ideas. So uh, from that point, this cooperation uh, definitely should work perfectly uh, in Estonia. Um, but of course, uh, the outcome of it, it needs to be practical, it needs to be safe, uh, it needs to be, of course, regulated. Um, and uh, most of all, people need to use it uh, mm. yes. because the innovation uh, could be ev anywhere. But if people uh, will not use it, then then th that's not the goal. So it, everything needs to make sense. You use this um, lovely term of a living lab, and also <coughs> as a pioneer, as you said. Um, 
not everything goes right from the very first start. So can you maybe share with us what are challenges you have already seen in implementing this innovation in Estonia? Well, of course, there's always challenges, but challenges are a good way, uh, mm. or a good thing, uh, because if we, if we conquer those challenges, the innovation comes to life. Mm. Um, but Estonia's public services are running effectively right now as well, definitely and easily, and they are easily accessible to everyone. Um, but um, this also goes to EMS, uh, but um, there's always a room for innovation, and then the, this needs to be the next step to, to map out and understand what, what are the needs and how we can uh, like serve pe uh, people quicker. Um, but uh, from the digital point, as you already said, 99% uh, of Estonian uh, uh, public services are digital. Uh, this goes to uh, EMS as well, but as I said, there's always room for the next, uh, next step. Mm. Um, but just to, to bring out, uh, but I think Estonia is uh, in a right place uh, to, uh, to, to innovate, to find next, uh, next ways to, to go into the future, as to say. Um, but maybe just a couple of examples, uh, just to give the, the overview of the Estonia and then, then the, the, the picture out of it. Um, our X-Road um, governmental infrastructure uh, provides uh, a secure movement for uh, data because all of our, almost all of our services are online. This, this means, and digital, this means that there's a lot of data. Also health, uh, health uh, data and, and statistics and so on. So everything needs to be in, in, in one system. And, and uh, I'm glad to say and that um, it's there in Estonia. Um, also, um, we're really flexible and then try to find ways uh, to collaborate with industry stakeholders uh, and to find um, um, the ways to, um, to make the framework work and to find legislative uh, um, like laws and then ground to do th that kind of innovation as well. Um, and just for the example out of it, uh, I think Estonia was the first um, country in the world to, uh, to uh, uh, make the law of AI and robo uh, robots. And then it's, it's really usual and, and <laughs> common to find uh, robots in the streets of, uh, of Tallinn as well, uh, the capital <laughs> of Estonia, where I'm also from. Uh, and um, just a, uh, like a, uh, a little bit funny example from last, uh, last winter was that, that I think we had the first robot traffic jam in, in, in Tallinn. <laughs> uh, of course, nothing uh, stops in, in Estonia when, uh, when there are snow, uh, and robots are not a different way there as well. So there were like, I think, 10 or 15 uh, uh, delivery robots uh, because um, the first one's battery died. Oh. <laughs> Things happen, challenges happen. Yeah. We yes, need yes. to move on from there. Um, and um, uh, also, um, you can find them in, in the traffic as well. Uh, just um, another day, um, I was stopping at the stoplight, and then we saw that, that OK, there's some car next to me, but there's nobody driving it. So it was a, like a, a, a new way, uh, understand, understanding that actually the future is already there. Um, from the startup scene, uh, proud to say that Estonia is a, um, we have the most unicorns per capita in, in the world. Uh, so that that shows actually innovation and then and, and the startup scene as well. Um, and um, yeah, I mean the the mindset uh, and offering fast track access to governmental systems, like in Lifesaver as well. We need to cooperate in a, in a national uh, national level, and then um, to show support and and, ex uh, and to find those um, um, experimental ways to to find the, those uh, new ideas. And also the fast, uh, last uh, maybe example, uh, because uh, there was um, quite a lot of uh, talk about hydrogen uh, yesterday as well. Uh, so um, I think we're the first um, um, a country where there's a national-wide hydrogen valley. And then uh, probably less, less than a decade uh, from now, there will be two-thirds of the, the power which is um, um, manufactured in, 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 in Estonia will be turned into hydrogen. So, um, yeah, innovation is definitely there.
Absolutely, and it's a fantastic playground for such an innovation like Lifesaver. Um, but can you maybe also tell us now concretely what are the next steps in Estonia to implement Lifesaver? Yes. The first step uh, is to review the, the uh, EMS uh, system to map out, to understand how it works, uh, to uh, how the collabor collaboration goes with digitalization and, and um, I don't know, emergency cars and, and so on, mm -hmm. to map out where are the needs uh, for that kind of uh, um, innovative um, innovation. And uh, from there on, uh, we need to uh, understand which are the scenarios we go further and, and, uh, and what are, what are the things we're going to solve? And uh, we expect to launch the Lifesaver program in the, in the first half of the next year, so 2023. That's very soon. Um, <laughs> thank you very much mm. for the introduction of Estonia. And again, fantastic to see the innovation scene you have in this country. Um, perfect for Lifesaver. So I would be now very much interested um, to hear from Nick and Hubertus about what are the concrete steps from a Lifesaver project or program in general. Um, maybe Nick, you would like to go first? Yes, and, and, and obviously the, the, the first sort of next step is to really use the Estonia opportunity to really um, work through those sort of foundation stages of Lifesaver. Um, and, and as Eunice just described there, is to look at the end-to-end -end process in Estonia and to really understand what's working well and, and what can be optimized. In my world, what we describe it as is bed to bed. Um, and, and that's really an, an important concept for people to understand. Um, you can't look at an emergency medical services system uh, as individual isolated part. It's not just purely the aviation element. It literally is from a point of critical event all the way through to the selection and safe and effective admission of that patient uh, into a medical provider. And where things go wrong or where things don't go quite to plan can be at any point along that continuum. And that's really what we want to try and and do as a first stage uh, in Estonia is really understand how the system works, uh, where we can see that there may be some uh, areas for improvement, um, and also areas, you know, to Eunice's uh, point, we'll, you know, we'll be working with a broad range of partners, where are there obvious routes for innovation, where we can really make a difference. And also within that, um, how can Lifesaver be a solution uh, that allows uh, equity in terms of access to healthcare, as, as Eunice described, uh, Estonia has an extremely sophisticated, very well-developed healthcare system, including its EMS system. But again, it also has a very dispersed population, uh, populations living in the islands. How can we ensure that there is um, healthcare equality in terms of provision of services? So quite, you know, quite some fundamental questions that we can help to, to resolve. And then also to look at how we can best medical practice. Um, there's this whole concept, which many of you probably are very familiar with, is the golden hour. What you do in those first 60 minutes in terms of supporting a patient in any critical event is can determine the sort of final, uh, final end, you know, the final situation for that particular patient. So anything that we can do through this process that makes that golden hour uh, particularly effective. Um, information chain exchange between the uh, first responders through to the medical providers, how we provision uh, the aviation assets to make sure that as that patient is moved from A to B, everything is done to facilitate. We basically use that golden hour for, for maximum impact. So this is really what we're going to, to do is that next stage is really get under the skin um, of the EMS system in Estonia and try and identify those areas for optimization, those areas for innovation, because we have a culture which absolutely embraces innovation and we want to uh, play our part in that. But also there's some just, uh, if you like, uh, set good practices and principles around effective medical health care and medical provision, like the golden hour. Um, how can we ensure that those are really uh, being met in the optimum way that they can. So a lot will come out of this first stage and then hopefully we'll move on to follow-on stages where we start implementing and innovating uh, some of the outcomes coming from that first, uh, that first review stage. 
Thank you, Nick. Airbus perspective, Hubertus. Yeah, just to, to add on those points from Nick and uh, maybe to uh, also mention the scenarios that you have mentioned, Jonas, so the, these scenarios will actually let us consider a very broad range of technologies, both in the operational side of the ecosystem, but we're also looking at technologies that can help manage the ecosystem in a more effective and a more efficient way. So there is a very broad spectrum, and then the scenarios will allow us to drill down and focus on what is most, uh, most impactful. And yeah, we are really looking forward the, to, to use the, all these capabilities that we can find in Estonia and um, bring them to life in this, uh, this framework. Thank you. Um, we have heard now, I mean, it's, it's a big thing. It's, it's more than just a simple product. There's an ecosystem, <laughs> there are framework <laughs> regulations. Mm. Um, so I think everyone is now interested in how does this fit into an actual strategic plan to improve our healthcare systems. Um, and looking at Europe, we are lucky to benefit from an insightful analysis of Henrik Pololai, the Director General of DG Move at the European Commission, who cannot be with us today, but we have a short video of him. Dear friends, it's great to be engaged in creating new opportunities and establishing the basis for new businesses at the EU and global level. The EU has taken the lead globally in the field of drones and it is now up to the member states and businesses to make things happen and to implement the framework that has been put in place. And we are all very much counting on you because this is a great opportunity. This is something that uh, you can start from the scratch, you don't have all kinds of legacy problems and you see also people who are enthusiastic and who are proactive and who have a can-do attitude. The glass is half full, not half empty. Innovative air mobility offers huge opportunities. It is estimated that by 2050 over 70 percent of the world's population will be living in cities. This calls for innovative forms of transport to meet the increasing demand from the public, to address ever-increasing mobility needs, as well as deliver efficiently available public services. The health sector in particular has a lot of potential in electrical vertical takeoff and landing aircraft which can play a full role as illustrated by Airbus's and International SOS's Life Saver program. As an Estonian, I am particularly pleased to note the development of this program in Estonia, capitalizing on the country's excellence in innovation, aviation and digital technologies. Beyond positive impacts for the society, electrical vertical takeoff and landing aircrafts are beneficial for the environment. And of course, they generate economic growth and economic activity in general. Against that background, we have just adopted the drone strategy 2.0. And I'm very proud about that. And I'm very pleased also that we have managed to get there. The great team has worked hard and of course built on the input that the European Drone Leaders Forum uh, allowed us to have. And now we have a collective responsibility to make sure that these operations can have real takeoff. As announced in the Drone Strategy 2.0, the Commission intends to adopt rules addressing the airworthiness of drones subject to certification, as well as the operational requirements applicable to manned VTOL capable aircraft. The experience and knowledge base of Airbus in this regard is fundamental. And I can only encourage you to continue working closely with EASA and us to make sure that the vision also becomes a reality. This will not only support the scaling up of the Lifesaver program to the rest of the world, but will also ensure that Europe continues to be at the forefront of the electrical vertical takeoff and landing aircraft and urban air mobility development more generally. Our ambition is that companies would start providing regular transport services for passengers, 
which will effectively integrate or complement existing transportation systems. They should contribute to the decarbonization by providing an alternative to carbon intensive modes of transport and urban air mobility should become a part of the future urban multimodal intelligent mobility ecosystem. Another important aspect is the development of new ground and air infrastructure, which can enable the development and the deployment and their integration in the urban area of these transport services. Finally, yet importantly, our vision is to facilitate this transition by providing a new use space architecture, proposing operational procedures and mechanisms that will pave the way for an integration between air traffic control and drone traffic managers. The aim, of course, is a full integration of cities and municipalities to the urban air mobility concept. And in this context, let me express again my appreciation to Airbus's efforts to coordinate the work across cities and regions, which are keen to include the innovative air mobility in their sustainable urban mobility plans. The sooner the cities get familiar with their role, the sooner they will be able to use this technology for the benefit of their citizens. With that, I wish you all good luck and a lot of success and thank you Airbus for all your efforts. And thank you, Henrik, for your kind words. Um, Balkis, um, Henrik just mentioned the topic of technology, so there is the question, okay, how does now Lifesaver fit into the entire ambition of Airbus when it comes to urban air mobility? Mm. Absolutely, and you're right. I mean, Henry uh, brought up a lot of important points, and if we take them one by one, and we started uh, the conversation today with this. So the Airbus purpose is to pioneer aerospace for a safe and united world. Again, safe and united is a theme that has flown through many of the conversations today and the previous panels that we have seen. Safe and united also means, yes, environmental factors, but it means access to healthcare. It means capacity building. It means ultimately saving lives. When we look at the portfolio of products across the many divisions of Airbus, our ability to serve this purpose, to save lives in emergency situations and challenging situations is one of the most critical missions and uh, activities that we do. And this is where we caught into, in fact, designing Lifesaver. Lifesaver, as was explained by Nick and Hubertus, provides us a system view. It's not just about a technology push on any singular element. It is about taking a look at a country level or a community level, how the current system is working and how to best insert new improvements, innovations, and investments to improve the overall performance of that health system. So this is the system view of Lifesaver, I would say. And when we step back and when we look at our eVTOLs, at Airbus, we're absolutely committed to urban air mobility. The technology brings something that is today unmatched. The technology of electrification, distributed propulsion, the sound levels, zero emission flight, all of this is useful for us when we are building urban air mobility, but it also has an incredible benefit to the rest of our products. Everything that is researched and developed in electrification with battery power, with new forms of propulsion, you've seen some of the examples over the past two days today, is helping to improve the overall product line of Airbus. Whether that is completely new products such as Zero E, or or our more conventional products, such as our helicopters, which are benefiting from hybridization and new technologies to help eliminate sound and emission levels. So this is from the technology perspective, I would say. And if we ultimately bring it back to the human level, as aerospace prof professionals and enthusiasts, I think we are all fascinated by, by what new technology can deliver. When we're looking at building urban air mobility, we're building it in a very, very public way for the public. So it is not just for aerospace enthusiasts and professionals. For the public to adopt, be excited, and accept and use this technology as part of their daily lives, it absolutely has to create a value. 
more and more we hear this. We hear this in our work with the cities and communities that we're doing with the European Commission. We hear this in the IASA surveys that are being done. Public health and emergency services are one of the first use cases and uses of any new technology, including eVTOLs. And this is why we really believe air medical services, advanced medical services with eVTOLs, will really be one of the first use cases. We call them feeder cases. They're feeder cases among several others. It's air medical services, ecotourism, passenger shuttle, that will help us collectively not only mature the technology, but allow the step-by-step -step adoption of this technology into our daily lives as citizens. So this is how it all comes together for us. Thank you, Balkis, and this was also a real great conclusion for this panel. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it's now time for Q&A. So for those uh, viewing us live on the YouTube stream, please use the Q&A functionality. Here in the room, the usual approach, raise your hand, microphone will come. Please you state your name and the publication you work for. And we have here in the back already the first one. Thank Hi, you. Hi, this is Sid from Bloomberg News. Just a quick question on EV tools. Uh, a lot of startups have actually made progress in terms of orders as well as are making development on those product plans. Are you concerned that Airbus is behind or do you expect Airbus to sort of use its existing customer base to actually drive EV toll mm. demand from other customers? No. So uh, thank you for the question. And if I split the question into two aspects of it. Uh, so for us, we've also taken the decision, and this is consistent with how Airbus is building any air product. We are not going to step into the business of our operators. We, as Airbus Helicopters and Airbus Commercial, are absolutely privileged. We have over 3,000 operators with running businesses and running capabilities. So we really take this as an introduction and extension of their business and technology portfolio. So this is from the operator perspective. And we are also secondly privileged to be 100% internally funded. So this allows us the freedom, if I may, to take a longer term perspective. What we are building here and what we are maturing here is the industry, the program, and the business of tomorrow. So this is our time frame that we are operating in. So it is incredible that there is so much attention and so much energy and investment going into the space that helps all of us because we are all looking for the next battery evolution. We're all looking for the next uh, charging station and charging infrastructure to be put in place. And this is for the collective good. But we take, as compared to others, in contrast to others, a more mid to long term perspective to say, how are we going to shape the future business pillar of Airbus and shape this industry? So if this answers the question fully. from Network Talks. I, I have two questions. Very heartening to see what's happening in Estonia and the trials. Does this require certification? And if yes, then which body certifies it? And uh, secondly, uh, probably this is more needed in congested cities like the metropolis of Paris, London, and, and many more cities in Asia. Uh, what is the roadmap? When do you see this coming to the metropolis where it's difficult to operate? Who wants to take the topic of certification? Do you mean certification for the vehicle, mm. eVTOL, or certification for the program, which is more to Estonia? Certification for the vehicle. OK, uh, so then I take the vehicle piece and happy for anyone else to join. So right now, uh, what we're planning and what we're working on is YASA certification under the SC VTOL category. Uh, so we've been working with YASA for years now also to help them shape what these regulations are going to be. And the regulations are on the aircraft itself, the regulations are on the operations, even the vertiport design and vertiport operations down to pilot training. What's fascinating about UAM and for all of us uh, who are following it is it's not we're building a vehicle and then the certification and then. So everything is being built in parallel. So the interconnectivity of all these activities and for us really to build as a community is absolutely important. And then as in traditional aerospace products, you know, there will be some countries who will develop their own, so the main bodies 
being YASA and FAA and CAA. And there are other countries who traditionally adopt the regulations of one of the main uh, leading regulatory authorities. So it, we would expect that it would be a similar approach. So. And the second part of the question, when, when we will get this also to large-scale cities, metropolis, as it was said, yeah, large-scale cities. I mean, so right now what we are building, as I mentioned, uh, so in Germany, because this is our main development center, we are building what we call the Air Mobility Initiative. So this is a program supported and funded by the German government where we are building the first, uh, we would call it a minimum viable product of the ecosystem itself. So yes, the vehicle, but the first operations and the first missions and the Verdiport design. So this is how we are building. And you see these living labs, to borrow your uh, term, and you know uh, these types of activities happening everywhere. Because we all need to learn. It's not just a fantastic vehicle that will make the service come to life in a city. It has to be customized also to the needs of the city. We find not only the type of vehicle and the range needs to be customized, the needs of the city in terms of which services are important to them are also very, very different. And this is why we work at the city level as well. So right now we have a partnering program called UIC2, supported by the European Commission, where we're working with about 42 cities to help them define what is most important for them. And this will drive the implementation, I would say. So the vehicle, the regulations, but what the cities are looking for and how quickly they can ramp up. I, I would just add on in terms of Lifesaver, moving away for purely from the pure technology, um, there are multiple parallel conversations going on around in addition to Estonia. Um, and also quite broad, because the, the whole concept behind Lifesaver uh, isn't a uh, particular domain or geography dependent. It, it can equally be effective. In fact, uh, one of the conversations is around uh, a significantly less developed and sophisticated healthcare system relative to Estonia, and is actually how Lifesaver can be a bridging point to um, help develop um, the sort of next tier of that particular healthcare system. Uh, it also has huge reapplicability actually into rural locations as well, uh, where you're looking at uh, long distances. And again, we're going to get some of that learning from Estonia because of the 2,000 islands, remote populations, uh, low density. So, uh, Lifesaver don't see it as being a pure. Um, urban solution, it actually, um, because it is a, a complete system, um, it can absolutely be tailored to, to multiple environments. And, and those are the conversations um, which are going on in parallel to where we're moving forward with Estonia. It has incredible reapplication uh, possibilities uh, in multiple scenarios. And this is also where, if I may compliment, think we see a lot of the work very similar, right? So mm. when we're looking at UAM and eVTOLs, as we said, we have to take a systems view and understand how it fits into the existing mobility system of any country or any community. And this is exactly what yeah. Lifesaver is doing, but with a very specific focus on the medical and emergency services of that country. So we benefit from the learning from each other. John Ostrow, the air current. Uh, forgive what might come, seem like a naive question, but given that Airbus has not launched City Airbus as a product, and it doesn't seem like Estonia has ordered City Airbus vehicles for its UAM system, what exactly is Airbus providing to Estonia? No. So first, if I can actually split the two, in as much as we want to connect the two, I think we also cause some confusion to say, uh, yes, it's, so Lifesaver is not uh, a UAM system. So Lifesaver is a medical uh, system, so, and I'll let the colleagues explain. And because we really have said from day one that medical services are the first use cases of urban air mobility, in our view, and one of the most critical, this is where we see the interconnectivity. But we're not at a stage, you're absolutely right, so we're all, 
this is also why we're not uh, signing LOIs or anything like that. We are not at a stage where we are looking to sell the product. The product will be mature, we're at the prototype phase, and when we're in program, as we do with any other uh, air product within Airbus, this is when we get into the commercial discussions. This is why partnering in terms of how we design and how we build and what we build is really important. This is the approach that we take on the eVTOL side of it. So, and then I let uh, answer yeah, maybe the just question to, on Lifesaver. To, to add a bit on, on that, so the first uh, step that we will do together is to really go through a very comprehensive assessment. I think Jonas Jov already mentioned that, to work out the most impactful scenarios that we would like to pursue. And then uh, we're thinking about, uh, just to, as an illustrative example, uh, di using digital technology to optimize the resource allocation. And so without an eVTOL, isn't there. Um, classical emergency medical resources across this uh, territory with the 2000 island and the remote areas. And then figuring out different use cases or scenarios to build essentially a credible pathway to the current state, so starting really today, to what the future might be when uh, we can operationally introduce those eVTOLs. Uh, hi there, uh, Tim Robinson, uh, Aerospace Magazine. Uh, so the idea of a, an eVTOL air ambulance sounds, like, sounds a great idea um, in uh, public good and also changing public's perception of maybe uh, air taxis for the risk. But with the city airbus with four packs, once you put a stretcher in there, defibrillator, medical bags, drugs, a paramedic, is there any going to be any useful payload? Thank you for the question. I think this is uh, one of the things that everyone has in mind. And this is where we go back to the complementarity of the two aircraft types. So VTOLs and uh, HEMS missions are absolutely unique. Again, I, I repeat, the power and capability and versatility of what a helicopter can deliver, both in terms of ability to reach and depending on the operator itself, the amount of in-cabin, in-flight interventions that can be done uh, is impressive. Uh, that's an understatement uh, for those who have seen it in operation. So we are not at all suggesting that you know the first generation of City Airbus Next Gen will be stretcher and have defibrillators and you know mm. have all of the complex uh, in-flight uh, capability. This is just not realistic. It's rather to say here is the capability and use and unique value proposition of a helicopter in these situations and what is the value you add when we provide something that is again zero emission flight electric lower nose noise profile so this is where we really see it hand in hand so we have to be to German aviation journalists actually now a follow-up of my predecessor's question mm -hmm. I was wondering um, you said it's complementary helicopters and UAMs um, I wonder if the overall market will be much bigger for the total of both and um, yeah how Actually, UAM could probably, will probably, in some way, eat in the helicopters, uh, helicopter market size. Maybe the Estonians also can give us the answer on their practical experiences with the emergency system in Estonia. How big do you think the role of the UAM, of the of the new system, will be compared to the helicopters? How much bigger will be the number of actual aircraft of both types that you might operate? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Um, well, there's definitely um, ways to use uh, eVTOLs uh, in Estonia because Estonia isn't isn't that uh, big of a scale, um, and uh, helicopters are used every day for EMS uh, systems uh, in Estonia. But uh, of course, um, eVTOLs and then the the whole system behind it is, um, in theory, it's it's way less expensive. Uh, than helicopters, and then the manufacturing of helicopters, and buying of helicopters, and so on. So, um, as we said already today, then definitely it needs to be uh, like um, side by side with uh, with each each other. Uh, but uh, I don't I don't see that that if we <laughs> if Estonia finds out now that we only need EV tolls, then the helicopters will stand in the in the garage. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> No idea. That's, no. the, that's the point of the first uh, <laughs> stage of the Lifesaver uh, program in, in Estonia, to find out where we can uh, get yeah. the uh, effects. 
And again, if we look at new missions and new markets mm. that are opening up with EV tolls, right? So really urban missions where you know regular helicopter services today are quite limited. So this is something that is very additive with this type of new technology as well. So, and even when we think of operations, there's some communities, you know, where because of restrictions for noise or residential needs, where even the duration and the times of the day of helicopter flights, even for emergency services, are limited. So, and if we imagine this, that, you know, at a certain point, you're just not able to get this rapid service and have this golden hour that we talked about, if we're able to bring in an alternative solution that is not restricted by these considerations, then this is something that is absolutely complementary and absolutely uh, a value add. So. We still have time for a last question. No one else in the room. Um, we also have online questions. Um, maybe Balkis to you. Um, so you talked about your different kind of use cases, um, and especially EMS is for you the core one. But can you quickly explain what are other use cases you see for urban air mobility? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Alex. I think EMS is uh, one that is for all the things and comments coming yeah. back uh, from the audience as well, uh, is a natural one. Uh, the benefits that we see are incredible. And it is, as we said, one of the feeder cases. So for us, emergency medical services or advanced medical services with EV tolls, ecotourism, again, where this type of vehicle and technology can serve a unique purpose, zero emission, low sound profiles. And then there's a third category, which is shuttle services. Shuttle services can be anything from airport to downtown, center to center, but these are scheduled shuttle services. And the reason why we as Airbus think about these types of services is it will allow the use and the acceptance of this type of technology to scale, and to scale step by step. When we think of the projections that come out from a lot of the experts, uh, consulting companies and so forth out there, there is a projection of a massive industry at some point in time where it is really point-to-point, on-demand, true air taxi missions. This is some point in the future. We take a pragmatic approach that says, this is not for tomorrow, so how do we build in a stepwise approach, maturing the technology, having the regulations and the infrastructure in place, with use cases where we know there is a need and a value to get to this point in the future, at whatever point it may be. So these are the three categories that, where we will start as Airbus. Thank you, Balkis. Thank you, gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, th this is now the end of this panel. Um, thank you again for your many questions. Um, and now we have a special event, and Jen will tell you more in a second. Thank you again, and Jen, the floor is yours. research, the CERN. This has to do with superconductivity and cryogenics. And so those are the two big words, and I'll stop there. And I'll hand over to Sandra Boucher for CEO of Airbus Up Next, and Raphael Bello, who's the CFO of CERN. Over to you, Sandra. It starts for a more superconductive and cryogenic 
talk about the powertrain, we talk about the distribution, the power electronics, the cooling system and the electrical motor. But in the definition of this demonstrator, there are two essential words. The first one is cryogenic. Cryogenic is just using the benefit of extremely low temperatures. And here we are talking about minus 150 degrees Celsius. But as you have heard, we are storing liquid hydrogen on board our aircraft, which means we have this cold source readily available. And if you use traditional electronics components and system at a cryogenic temperature, you actually reduce the electrical losses and therefore you improve their performance. And if we go a step further into the superconducting world, and here we're talking around minus 190 degrees Celsius, then it's even more interesting because the electrical resistance literally becomes zero. And all of a sudden, you're capable of transporting megawatts in small cables. If you wind this tape here and you put it in again, you have the cryogenic cooling system around it, you end up with a four centimeters diameter cable that is capable of transporting megawatts. And this could actually be a breakthrough in our industry. And with the work that has been done on Ascent so far, we are confident that there is potential in it. And we want to further mature it to really understand how this technology could serve us in the ambition to reduce the weight and therefore have more efficient power electronic systems and power trains and have this as an opportunity in our roadmap to decarbonize the skies. So the demonstrator, as such, has done all the technical um, analysis. We are right now in the man manufacturing phase, and you will see this afternoon that it will be built and constructed here in this facility in EAS with, with um, power on, which we hope to be mid of next year. But we have already the confidence that there is a great potential and we want to accelerate this maturity. And this is why I'm so happy to be with you here today, Raphael, from CERN, the world leader laboratory in superconducting technologies, to really work together. And if I may, I would like also to, um, to bounce back to the first panel discussion we had this morning, where one of the questions was about how do we actually measure the leakage of hydrogen. And CERN is also a very valuable partner because of their knowledge in instrumentation and the capability of measuring hydrogen leakages. So with that, I will hand over to you, for Rafael. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you very much, Jenny, as well. No, thank you for the invitation. I think it's very inspiring. Yeah. I would like to focus maybe for those who don't know CERN enough, uh, vary in some high level features. As you know, we are the biggest laboratory on particle physics in the world, and it happens to be in Europe. So this is the first good news. Uh, it has been created in 54, and since then we have progressively built the great success uh, that we all know now. Roughly speaking, uh, we are gathering a community of 18,000 people. Most of them are what we call the users enjoying our facilities. 1.2 billion Swiss francs per year as a budget. And of course, we have the mandate to design, build, operate uh, large, very specific facilities. The flagship, flagship one is the Large Hadron Collider, which is a 27 kilometers underground uh, accelerator, which make collisions of particles, different various particles, to see where do we come from, what is the universe is made of, and to recreate the conditions of the Big Bang a few milliseconds after the Big Bang. So it's quite, it gives sometimes a, a, a very uh, crazy uh, perception of what we can do or what we should do. But of course, to deliver these kind of facilities, we have to develop, and we developed already for 70 years, almost 70 years yet, um, different technologies on vacuum, cryogenic, and we will come back, uh, uh, magnets, and of course, superconducting links and equipment. Also, IT and uh, artificial intelligence. 
Just to give you now uh, maybe a rough idea on our R&D, we are spending at least a third of our budget and our activity with people and money for R&D, both in technologies and also in instrumentation, because we are not only theoreticians, we are mainly, I would say, engineers, technicians to develop those infrastructure. So we are developing this for our scientific purposes, I already mentioned it, but also it happens that it could be useful for other partners and society in general. And this is also one of our mandate, one of our mission is to support the dissemination of our technologies to the rest of the society. And we've done this in the past, of course. You might know that we have uh, invented the uh, World Wide Web uh, now 30 years ago. Uh, but we are also working on scan uh, for medicine application and, and cancer treatment as well. And another example, working on radiation dosimetry detection uh, for um, partners like NASA, for example. So now, why? Coming back to the relationship and the cooperation with Airbus and Airbus Up Next. Why do we do that? Okay, first of all, we do believe that CERN has something to provide to Airbus in that matter, and vice versa, I would say, because it happens that we always try to learn also from our partner and not only lecturing them. Hopefully, we will do it again in the, in the, in the future. Second uh, uh, rationale, I would say, because we are sharing the same values. First of all, in terms of being trying to be as innovative as possible, but also to rely on the highest performance, on the highest standards of security, availability, um, and keeping the best standards in reliability as well. And this is, of course, key in our business as suspects like the uh, um, um, aircraft business as well. So we are working on converging technologies, definitely. Hence the point of today, because we do believe that CERN has the capacity to provide and to enjoy its technologies to Air, uh, Airbus up next, in particular to create a new demonstrator for next year. The, this demonstrator will create AC links to support the aircraft power distribution systems in general. And then, of course, this will be the first step of our collaboration. Hopefully, will be much other new, uh, new steps in the journey towards and to, to include also maybe other partners, other stakeholders, including European stakeholders, European Commission and other industry partners, and to push again the limits of our technology. So um, I will be very happy to look forward this new collaboration and, of course, to also work on the next steps already. Thank so you. Thank you very much. <laughs> so let's let's sign the agreement. Super. Thank you. Please. Thank you. You can step forward if you'd like to take some pictures. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Now, are there any questions? Oh, another, <laughs> another picture. Well, that's Stefan taking another picture. Shaking. 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 Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Are there any questions in the room? Down here. <coughs> Thank you, Richard. Do you think that this is already applicable on a zero E project where you have cryogenic technology and maybe this? So clearly today we are investigating different routes and we will be able to make the best so choices once we have gained enough maturity in the different technological bricks we are exploring. So this is one part of it, and it will be part of the decision making. Because what is important when you do choices on an aircraft is you are not going for an optimum local solution, you want a global optimum. And therefore, it's important that we first mature the different bricks, and this will be one step into maturing the cryogenic and superconducting 
distribution system. And once we have this knowledge with the overall control of the aircraft, we'll be able to make the best choices. So in terms of timing, there are different components to it, actually. You, I talked about a powertrain. It's about distribution, but it's also about an electrical motor. And clearly, depending on what you look at, there will be a different timeline associated to it. We believe that electronic distribution could be much more very soon. If we look into a wheel fully few megawatt cryogenic and superconducting e-motor, it will be further down the line. But it is a very important for us at Airbus in this pioneering spirit we have showing you over the last two days to really push and also already explore technologies that will not necessarily be mature in the coming years, but are paving the way for our future products. Tim? Hello there, uh, Tim Robinson. Uh, Sandra, uh, we've heard, over the past two days we've heard about electrics, batteries, power, fuel cells, and now megawatt class cables. So my question is, what, what is Airbus doing on thermal management of all this electric power you're going to be sticked on in your aircraft? Mm. How are you going to cope with all the heat, heat management? So clearly, heat management is an absolutely essential component into those technologies, and there's a huge team in Zero E, but vastly around Airbus, working on what is the best optimum in terms of heat management to deal with those different technologies we'll bring on board of the aircrafts. Thierry? Thierry, Thierry Aviation Week. Uh, could you please clarify whether uh, super connectivity could be ready, could have the right technology readiness level in time for zero product launch in 2027-2028? Well, again, it depends what we are talking about. If we talk about the capability of distributing megawatt because we choose to distribute electricity, I believe it can have the maturity. If we talk about a several megawatt um, superconducting motor, then no, this will not be ready in 2027, but it will be ready further down the line. One last question from the room, perhaps. No? Well, let's give Sandra and Raphael another round of applause. Congratulations Thank you. on the partnership. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe we'll take it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. So ladies and gentlemen, I hope you've enjoyed the summit. It's been great to see you all in person in Toulouse yesterday and here in Munich today. Thank you also to those who've connected digitally from all over the world. Plus, a big thank you, especially to our speakers and panelists, and of course, to Airbus colleagues who have organized this event across borders. It's been a fascinating couple of days. We've heard from people across the aerospace industry, and from NGOs as well as policymakers. One thing is clear, it's a time of action, speed, and acceleration on sustainability for our sector. We've seen signs of progress everywhere. The emergence of an ecosystem for sustainable aviation fuels, exciting developments on hydrogen and hybridization. We've heard about all the amazing things happening in the space sector and met Airbus's newly selected astronaut, Pablo Alvarez Fernandez. Today, the industry's decarbonization plans have received valuable scrutiny from the Environmental Defense Fund. We've also focused on the efforts to strengthen Europeans' defense sovereignty to reflect the reality of war on Europe's borders. All in all, the sector is gathering pace on sustainability making concrete, tangible progress. There's recognition that aviation's path to, next, to net zero is credible, and there's acceptance that the time for excuses is over. 
there's a real commitment to making the 2020s the decade of change. Guillaume Fauré mentioned that yesterday. And in his words, profound, far-reaching change. Another message to emerge from the summit is that the clock is ticking. The sector has set itself some tough deadlines, and some of these deadlines are fast approaching. They're not going to go away. So I hope that we and our partners can use this summit as a springboard for further action and alignment to accelerate the pace of change. So on behalf of everyone at Airbus, everyone here in the room, and there are a number of executive committee members here today also, thank you so much for coming. Please, let's stay in touch and have a safe journey home. Thank you. <laughs>